Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining this Managing Multimorbidity Seminar or Multiple Long-Term Conditions uh, it's, is the term used by NIHR. Multimorbidity is a key challenge, as you know, for modern healthcare as well as people living with the condition, because people are living longer. The majority of people over 65 years of age will have two or more conditions. The majority over 75 years will have three or more conditions. And uh, more people will have two conditions than only have one condition. And we know multiple long-term conditions are increasing in the young as well. Multimorbidities and people with comorbidity are more likely to die or be hospitalized with COVID-19. And we've seen uh, that, the, the, that that the case uh, during uh, the last 18 months. And we'll be dis discussing some of those uh, uh, findings as well. And the purpose of this event is to bring together all the academics alongside clinicians, public health professionals, important patient groups, and others working in the field to present on the current research, discuss priority areas, and look for ways to work together for mutual benefit. This event is also to help us generate ideas and discussions about priorities and future challenges and how we can all work together. We'll be hearing a, a number of examples of excellent practice from across the arcs, uh, which cover the whole of England. And you'll also hear a number of key presentations from uh, key people who are working closely in delivering a national research program on multiple long-term conditions. Uh, we're very delighted that uh, there's so much interest. We've had over 450 people registered for the event. Uh, if we can have the next slide uh, for the agendas, please. So uh, we've got a very, very tight schedule. I'm sorry about this. Um, um, we are delighted uh, with our keynote speaker, which I will uh, present shortly. Uh, we've got an overview of the work that ARC East Midlands is doing, uh, and I'll present that. We're also delighted we've got Medina, um, who will be talking uh, about uh, quite a lot of work programs that are going within an IHR. Um, the National Multiple Long-Term Conditions Prioritization Process that uh, Ash Routon from our team led, um, we'll hear about the uh, patient views on multiple long-term conditions. And then uh, we'll have a break. Next slide, please. Following this, we asked you to send in uh, examples of work that you're doing within uh, the various ARCs. And we've uh, selected a number of uh, ARCs who will be presenting on the work programs. Um, I wasn't involved in, uh, in uh, picking this. So uh, if there are people who are not happy, then uh, I'll direct you to the the group that uh, chose these uh, projects. Um, we'll then have uh, finally Gary Ford talking to us about the approaches to uh, multiple long-term conditions implementation, particularly uh, the AHSN perspective, and then uh, finally finish with uh, the future challenges that we may have. But I'm really delighted our keynote speaker uh, today is Chris Whitty, Chris, Professor Chris Whitty, who's been uh, extremely busy and Chris thank you so much for taking the time out today um, to join this. Um, as you all know he's the Chief Medical Officer for England and Chief Medical Advisor to the UK government and was until August 21 the Chief Executive of the NIHR and he's really uh, led uh, the program of uh, multimorbidity and championed for, for this for a number of years. And it's great to see that this is uh, now uh, such a leading priority area within not only an eye chart, but more widely as well. Um, so Chris, we're delighted. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Kamlesh. Um, so I just, in a sense, most of the points I'm gonna make will be very obvious to this group, but I think they're worth just laying out um, before we start in what looks like a very, very interesting and stimulating program. I mean, as Kamesh said in his uh, remarks, um, the, there's a growing issue with multi-morbidity or multiple long-term conditions. Um, and uh, the, the reality is that once we get above 65 or 70, the majority of people who present to healthcare services uh, and have healthcare needs will have more than one condition uh, in, uh, in many, many and in probably in most settings. Uh, despite that, um, the direction of travel of clinical medicine over the last uh, 30 years has been increasing specialization. Uh, so those two, in a sense, are pushing in opposite directions. And I think that's not the, the, that's not the limitation of the problems. Uh, clinical training and uh, scientific training tends to be along single disease pathways. Um, 
the significant uh, single disease approaches to service delivery, whether that be clinics, for example, uh, uh, or uh, whether that be things like NICE guidelines, which tend to start with a disease and just move outwards from that. Biomedical models uh, tend to take a, a very single disease approach. Uh, clinical studies in this area have been few and far between until very recently. Uh, and in fact, the earliest call that was done jointly with MRC really had quite a thin, um, uh, quite a thin offering. Uh, but that really has changed, thanks to the work of Order View and others uh, recently. Uh, and unfortunately, um, trials, clinical trials, have systematically excluded people with more than one condition, uh, it, although that is improving to some degree. Uh, but that is a very serious uh, barrier because that actually means that they are, are atypical for people who arrive. And at a patient level or a public level, uh, many people are living with three or four conditions, any one of which on its own, uh, they could survive with and operate in, an, in a way which is acceptable uh, and provided good quality of life. But when combined, uh, provide them with very serious impediments to having the quality of life that they should have. So this is a significant issue for people uh, at whatever level you talk about, scientific, uh, clinical delivery, or, um, or actually living a, a good life. And I think we should be honest and say that actually the medical profession and biomedical science more widely has not really taken this as seriously as historically they should have done. But I think we're in a much better place now. So that's the first general point. Um, the second point is something which uh, several of you have heard me say before, but I just wanted to reiterate it because I do think it's important in the way we conceptualize this. Um, conditions that make up multiple morbidity or multiple lung conditions do not occur together just randomly, or at least some of them will be random, but actually with a large number of the combinations that you see, uh, they, are, they are predictable. Some of them are predictable because they are random, but they are very common conditions that you would expect to coexist. But very many of them will be overrepresented. They will be clustered together, uh, either because of biological or social or uh, behavioral um, uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and some of them are so obvious that we've known about them for a long time. So the cluster of diseases around smoking, for example, the cluster of diseases around diabetes, uh, or uh, around obesity, which is a combination of um, uh, social interactions uh, and uh, genetic factors. And then some of them might be around very specific uh, uh, genetic issues. So for example, sickle cell, uh, um, homozygous sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis have a series of, of diseases that cluster around them, but there will be very many more. And one of the strands of work that started recently is trying to identify these clusters using uh, newer techniques, newer uh, um, methods of analysis and indeed AI uh, to try and find them. Because if you can find a cluster, as a minimum, it tells you which are the groups of conditions that you should be uh, examining together. And it may point to uh, a pathway, whether biological or social, as to why that cluster exists. And then third point I want to make really follows on from that, which is if you've got a pathway, that may give you a method of um, intervening that might actually not just stop one disease, but in fact might stop several because they're all on the same pathway, which you found by noting the common clustering. And that, of course, is what happened with uh, smoking uh, and uh, uh, is happening uh, with obesity, just to take well-known examples. Uh, those might be um, because there's a social pathway or a behavioral pathway, there's a particular group of things that happen as a result of particular behaviors, uh, but it also might be a biological one due to genetic or other factors, and that might in fact lead to you saying, well, there are particular disease uh, interventions, whether they be drugs or, um, or, or social interventions, that could lead to a reduction, not just in one condition, but in multiple conditions, and actually therefore lead to more parsimonious medicine, because one of the big problems we all know is the problems of uh, multiple uh, treatments and polypharmacy, for example. If we have a single pathway or a limited number of pathways, uh, that we should be able to address those systematically. So um, there are good, biological or biomedical reasons. And then there are also uh, issues in which the, the different things interact socially in uh, someone. And it may be that single interventions with someone who's got multiple morbidities may have a transformational effect. So that someone might have 
a, a group of diseases, but if you can deal with one of the problems, let us say they have cataracts, and I'm, I'm just using as an example, uh, that may or make all the other uh, conditions they have easier for them to manage. So research has a very substantial uh, way to go on this, as we're really in the foothills here, but there's, there is the opportunity to have impact, not just on a single disease, but on lives of people with multiple diseases, and indeed on stopping or in some cases treating multiple diseases with a relatively straightforward pathway. And the final thing that really the research allows us to do, and the power of biomedicine is quite extraordinary, and I think we've just lived through uh, two years in which that's yet again been demonstrated, is if we can provide a systematic approach to this, if we can think about this in a systematic way, uh, then we are actually in a strong position um, to actually uh, reform the way that both um, these diseases are conceptualized, uh, reform the way that clinical services are provided, reform the way that social care is provided, uh, and actually get the medical profession and uh, social care, nursing, uh, and associated professions to think about uh, patients and citizens uh, in a more systematic way that actually takes account of all the things that they simultaneously have uh, rather than just uh, one or two. So I think there is a huge amount for us to uh, to aim for in this. Uh, it's a difficult area and you know science has not really been set up in this way uh, historically. So this is actually harder because we're having to rethink the way we do uh, research in some cases but it also has uh, really very substantial gains at the end of it if we can get it right. And you know, as, as the uh, programme today shows, compared to where we were just two or three years ago, uh, we really have moved a very long way in this field. And I'm extremely grateful to the researchers who've done that. So Kamlesh, I don't want to really take more, more time from the important discussions people ha have uh, to move on to, but those are really the key points I just wanted to raise at the beginning of this, uh, this talk this, um, uh, this afternoon. Chris, thank you so much. Um, if there's any questions, do put them on um, the question and answer uh, tab. Um, Chris, uh, thank you very much for giving us your overview in terms of complexity. Uh, I know you've now moved out from NIHR uh, into uh, as the CMO. What, what are the roles that you take forward there in terms of prioritizing multiple long-term conditions at population level? So, I mean, I, I, I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to, when I first started as uh, CMO following Sally Davis, it, this is one of the things I really wanted to push on clinically and in public health terms, because it very clearly is a growing problem and it's already a large problem and is going to be a growing problem over the next two decades. So it's got to be tackled uh, both in the way that the medical profession uh, and wider health services, but the medical profession is obviously the one the CMO is most engaged in, but also public health uh, should be engaging on. So uh, it's something which I will be coming back to and reinforcing the importance of this uh, and the importance of people maintaining, for example, generalist skills in clinical care uh, as, as we bring in the, the new science that's going to evolve from the kind of work that's being discussed this afternoon. So I'm, I'm going to continue to push this really quite hard through my, the rest of my time as CMO. That's great. Um, and any questions from the faculty at all? Uh, please um, just uh, show yourself if, if there are any questions. There's one in, in the chat. Do you think people's expectations of the medical profession has raised beyond what can realistically be done or achieved? Quite a good question. Now. You're, you're on mute, uh, sorry, um, Chris. There's always going to be a gap uh, between what the medical profession, what people would like the medical profession to do and what the medical profession can do. Actually, the, the extraordinary thing, if you look over the history of the medical profession, is we can do far more now than we could even a decade ago and massively more now than when most of us were born. Uh, it, you know, the medical profession uh, and medical science, which feeds into it, increases the number of things we can do the whole time. Of course, at the same time, people's expectations continue to rise. Uh, and that's a phenomenon uh, all around the world that isn't just in the UK. Um, and the gap between what people would want the medical profession to do and what they can do scientifically, resources aside, and then the second gap between what the medical profession could do with limitless resources and what it's able to provide everywhere globally, 
uh, there's always gonna be a gap there. And there's no nation where that's not true. Both of those gaps exist in every nation. Uh, they, they, they land in slightly different ways and they land in slightly different bits of the, the health service. But that, that gap will always, always exist. And will, will it, you know, I don't think we should kid ourselves there will ever be a point where there is no gap. But I think one of the ways that research can deal with this is they can, it can actually narrow the gap from a scientific point of view. So at least it can say, we can say, we can do something about this. And then there's a second order question, very important second order question as to how we can organize services so that we do do it. But until we actually have a proper evidence base, clearly you can't make that additional step. Thanks. There's a question from Rod Taylor in the, in the, in the panelists, from the panelists as well. I think it's, it's linked to what you've just said. Um, that uh, we have a, a finite economic NHS and social care resources, we never have the chance to treat all. Are we at the stage where we think we can best prioritize multi-mobility intervention approaches? Well, I think I, I, would, I would divide, I mean, firstly, I mean, my own hope, in fact, my own expectation, not just hope, my expectation is that as we understand multi-mobility, we'll be able to intervene further in the earlier in the pathway, leading to the fact that actually people have uh, fewer individual conditions and less multimorbidity. So the first thing is what we want to try and do is actually not see this only as waiting till people have got multiple long-term conditions and then intervening to treat them. I think we should be aiming simultaneously, we should be doing that, we should aim, aiming simultaneously to move upstream of that uh, and actually to try and prevent them. Uh, the way that I would, I conceptualize this myself is that uh, what you want to push is as much of the disease process that is in train off to the right of the point when people naturally would have come to the end of their natural life. So you're basically trying to push it out. So people would eventually get uh, multimorbidity aged 120, uh, but actually if they, uh, you know, if they uh, pass away after a good and, and fulfilled life in their 90s, then actually many of those problems are reduced. So you push things off to the right and therefore you reduce the amount of multimorbidity people suffer in their lifetimes. That's brilliant. I mean, in fact, you've answered two of the questions that have come out of the public health uh, in prevention of long-term conditions. I, uh, we'll just have a very quick uh, question here. Do you think there's a relationship between multimorbidity and health inequalities? Uh, there's no, there's not, there's not, I uh, think about it, the evidence on this is overwhelming. Uh, and in fact, many of the early studies, multiple studies have looked at this. And in broad terms, they all tend to show that, that that you know, roughly a decade earlier, people start to acquire multimorbidity uh, in areas of deprivation. Actually, the more granular you are at that, the earlier, the bigger the gap between the uh, people who develop this early and the people who develop this late. Now, some of this is due to things that we know about, like smoking and obesity, but a lot of it will be due to other factors uh, which we need to identify and then to address. That's wonderful, Chris. Thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule, also answering those questions. Um, you're welcome to stay, but I know you are very, very busy, so stay as long as you can, and, and uh, if there's any questions, do put them to the panel. So, but, but again, on behalf of all the ARC uh, uh, faculty, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks, Kevin. Right, we shall move on to the next agenda item. Um, uh, I'll give an overview in terms of the work that uh, East Midlands ARC has been doing. I'll... Uh, just share my slides uh, with you. Uh, can you see my slides? If someone just says yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just over a few minutes, just uh, the, the work that uh, uh, we're uh, doing, as you know, we, the ARC East Midlands is the lead for managing multimorbidity across the national arcs. And that's why we brought this as well as for, for uh, reasons that we, we are also the priority theme for multi, managing multimorbidity. So in terms of the missions of our theme is that we want to address regional and national healthcare priority areas relating to multiple long-term conditions, particularly in cardiometabolic multimorbidity, but that's where we have a, a lot of interest, but we're moving into more wider, and particularly bringing in mental health as well. As well. Um, we know it's uh, associated with uh, increased healthcare costs and resource utilization, including healthcare visits, hospital visits, medications, and we're doing uh, quite a bit of work in this area as well. 
Um, in terms of research, you've already heard that it's going to impact not on the quantity, but the quality of, of life. And this theme really brings world-class academics with uh, patient groups and other community representatives, clinicians, managers from the NHS services, uh, public health, social care, commercial organizations, third-party sectors, and other NIHR infrastructure groups, uh, as well as the East Midlands AHS. And, and by NIHR infrastructure groups, I mean, uh, we're very closely linked with our BRC. We're very closely linked uh, with RDS. Uh, and, and we're doing quite a lot of work together, um, co-producing this research really to tackle uh, the challenges that we have uh, currently in both prevention and management. Um, and we have two broad areas of work. First of all, looking at uh, epidemiological studies, uh, the burden of disease, the care gaps and variations in care compared to evidence-based guidelines using large data sources and uh, interventional studies uh, of uh, patient level, and healthcare professional level interventions to prevent and improve the management of not only cardiometabolic health, but other conditions as well. Um, we've been uh, very fortunate to have uh, links to a number of other centers. So we've been uh, very quick to act on the natural, re natural response to COVID-19 pandemic by uh, leading on some of the work on multiple long-term conditions and uh, COVID-19. And we've used a number of methods uh, from the group, including routine databases, service evaluations, pragmatic randomized control trials, and economic evaluations. And I said, we're very, very much linked with BRCs and NIHR School for Primary Care Research at Nottingham as well. Um, and uh, we're fortunate enough to be also funded the uh, uh, lead uh, national arc on the multimorbidity implementation group, which you'll hear about shortly. Just to give you a flavor of some of the projects that we are conducting, uh, improving statin adherence, in, uh, because we know that uh, adherence goes down in people with multiple long-term conditions and people with cardiometabolic diseases are more likely to have other long-term conditions. So this is uh, looking at a text messaging intervention, randomized control trial at practice level to try and improve adherence. Um, we know people with multiple long-term conditions are on a number of therapies. We're good at starting therapies, but we're not very good at stopping therapies. So there's another cluster of randomized controlled trials, which is just about to start on uh, reducing inappropriate uh, glucose lowering medications to prevent overtreatment in the management of all failed people with type 2 diabetes. And most of these will have multiple long term conditions. We've got a community championing training program to increase awareness and screening for multiple long term conditions. This is an empowering community studies. And as I mentioned, program of epidemiological studies as well. I'm not going to dwell on to the multimorbidity implementation group because we have got a session. As you know, there were six uh, key areas that were funded. One was on multiple long-term conditions, and uh, we were successful in um, uh, leading on this. Uh, about 1.8 million allocated uh, to form a national implementation program through cross art collaborations. And uh, we went through a prioritization process and, and a number of projects have been funded in this area. Um, these are the, the projects that have been funded, um, um, but as I say, we'll, I'll, I'll leave this uh, for details uh, uh, a little bit later on. Um, as well as these four projects, uh, we have another project which will be evaluating across these uh, four funded projects. Uh, in terms of the implementation elements of these projects. And we have a PhD studentship funded uh, as part of this program as well. In terms of uh, uh, publications, uh, these are some of the publications that have come out from the ARC East Midlands and the multimorbidity theme. And in particular, we're uh, very uh, um, proud of conducting interventional trials. Uh, Chris mentioned that there is lack of either interventional studies or people uh, who have multiple long-term conditions who are uh, 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 included in some of the trials that are ongoing. And so the, the top one was looking at promoting physical activity in uh, people with multiple long-term conditions. This was a randomized controlled trial. It showed some improvements in step counts, but unfortunately the people who took part in this study were already um, doing uh, quite a, a lot of exercise and so I think our challenges are recruiting the right participants and, and that's the next stage we're uh, taking forward. 
Um, you, there's uh, another one, physical activity after cardiac uh, uh, events, that's a randomized controlled trial, again, showed some uh, improved outcomes. On the left-hand side, Andy Willis from my group led on uh, a software program to prompt healthcare professionals training on coding for uh, people with cardiometabolic and renal uh, multiple conditions. And this showed that coding did improve, but risk factor control didn't improve. And then a number of systematic reviews uh, regarding uh, how to prevent cardiovascular disease and how uh, and, and bar barriers to and facilitators to initiation of therapies in certain populations. Um, we've had a huge program of work on looking at clustering of uh, multiple long-term conditions. This is all uh, using routine large data sets. And, and you'll see Yogini, uh, who features quite a lot here. She's been leading this work from uh, our group, and she's continued to lead the work on multiple long-term conditions, both in uh, within COVID and outside of COVID as well. Um, there's a number of systematic reviews that are planned as part of this uh, theme. Um, this includes home-based exercises. And, and these ideas came about because of COVID. Um, we, we thought about what, what are the key areas that we should be looking at during COVID. Um, there's uh, disruptions and impact on uh, uh, control of risk factors in people with uh, diabetes and multiple long-term conditions. Um, COVID-induced uh, disruptions and impact on healthcare utilization in people with multiple long-term conditions. Uh, looking at prevalence and effects of symptomatic COVID-19 in hospitalized and non-hospitalized people. Uh, who've had COVID lifestyle interventions uh, for multiple long-term conditions, including uh, depression. Um, one of the areas we thought about before pandemic was uh, people with long-term conditions, multiple long-term conditions have a lot of tests being ordered. And can we try and reduce that? So this is a, a, a program of work that we are uh, currently just uh, uh, in the planning stages. And the second one linked up about cancer screening also uh, is associated with this as well. These are some of the work that program work program that we've done on COVID nineteen and multiple long term conditions. And again, I'd like to thank the the ARC team uh, and the real world evidence team who have helped, uh, including uh, coming out with policy recommendations on management of people with uh, uh, chronic uh, long term conditions, particularly multiple long term conditions. This has just recently come out. This is a much wider collaboration. Uh, Bruce Guthrie is uh, leading on this, and there's a, a number of ARCs involved, but this was funded by HDR UK. And this was an interesting systematic review just published on variations in the measurement of multiple long-term conditions. This is a systematic review of 566 studies. Um, and uh, this is a huge piece of work and uh, very pleased to be part of this. And this showed the definitions in terms of 36% of the studies didn't have any definitions. Number of conditions uh, included varied from 2 to 285 with a median of 17. And the commonest conditions were cardiovascular, endocrine, respiratory, musculoskeletal, and uh, uh, mental health. But this is what some of the things that Chris mentioned in terms of clustering. We have real uh, challenges in terms of which clusters are are uh, come together in people, people with multiple long-term conditions. And indeed, this shows which cluster we should include because uh, measurement of multimorbidity, it seems, is, is poorly recorded and it's very variable. So I'm hoping some of this will, work will feed on to the work that we and others are doing. Um, there's a huge program of PhDs um, that, again, are within multiple long-term conditions. The other thing we're trying to bring in together, because we have a huge interest in ethnic minority populations, is most of these programs of work, we're trying to see if we can get data separately for ethnic minority populations. And uh, we're trying to embed the, these uh, within the PhDs as well. Um, again, uh, just putting in some of the, the additional funding that's been uh, awarded uh, in collaboration with our, uh, either ourselves or, or with other outside researchers. As you can see, quite a few of the COVID studies um, are uh, highlighted here, which uh, ARC East Midlands is collaborating with a very large one, Ami Banerjee Stimulate ICP, which uh, was just funded uh, recently. 
has been HDR UK uh, funded uh, ourselves and to research looking at the ethnicity and, and multiple long term conditions. Uh, but there's been a number of other program grants and I've come to program grants a bit later on because there is a, a huge opportunity for the ARC family to get, work together to put in uh, program grants. Uh, and I'll end there. So thank you very much uh, for listening. I'm happy to take some questions, but I'll stop sharing my slides. Uh, Uh, there's a question here with regards to recruitment of the study on uh, multimorbidity and physical activity. I'm wondering if lower levels physical activity could be been part of the eligibility criteria. No, it wasn't an uh, eligibility criteria. Any, we, we basically had an age criteria and uh, people with multiple long-term conditions. Those were the two inclusion criteria. Um, but the people who did take part, they on average were uh, had higher physical activity levels than you would expect for that age group. So I think now we probably will need to restrict uh, the, uh, in terms of the people who are not as physical activity if we're going to take this to the next stage, which we're planning at the moment. Um, any other question? I'm moving between chat and questions and answer because the chat has the questions from the panel. Um, Uh, this is just uh, Lucy saying this is very relevant because she's working in this area. Um, Oyakola, um, interested in clustering of sickle cell disease. How can the clustering be applied there? Chris, uh, who, as we know, is uh, uh, has been le leading in this work. Do we think there will ever be an agreed definition? Chris, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, I think what the, the, the work program, the HDR UK has funded um, uh, that uh, um, Bruce Guthrie is leading on we're part of, that's trying to try and do that because there's, there's especially a core outcome set that we really should be including. And I think that the, um, this work is, is in, the, in its final stages, it should come out soon. I think uh, there's no further questions. So in view of time, we'll move on. I think we're, we're running well on time, which is great. Um, Medina, thanks very much for joining us again. A very busy person who pro probably knows about uh, what's going on in, within NIHR uh, and multiple long term conditions than anyone else, especially that she led on the scoping exercise on this. So Medina Kara, who most people here will know, uh, but if you don't, she is the uh, uh, multiple long-term condition strategy implementation lead with NIHR and NOCRI. Um, Medina, again, thank you very much for taking the time out uh, uh, to present today. That's great. Thank you, Kamlesh, for the invite. And I honestly don't think anyone is busier than you. So um, I will just share my screen and hopefully you can all see that. Where is my slides? Uh, green, can you all see that? That's great. So thank you for the opportunity. As I've sort of said, uh, Kamalesh, I will touch on really two parts. Um, it's great to actually follow, I think, Chris's uh, first sort of presentation and, and and sort of come at much more of the how we are implementing some of the strategic initiatives at NIHR uh, in this topic. So really, I'm going to try and focus on how we're trying to harness the expertise that sits across our NIHR infrastructure across the translational applied and policy research side of it to address the needs of people with long term conditions. So I sit in a, in a team within NIHR, which is the NIHR Office for Clinical Research Infrastructure. As many of you know, NIHR is a very large organization and, and our team is really set up to help navigate uh, people across the system. So for example, how do we help support uh, industry and charity engagement across the NIHR and, and also to build collaborations across the different pieces of infrastructure that we that we fund and, and really harness that expertise. So we're split across sort of three functions. One is looking at building and supporting collaborations of the NIHR infrastructure and then linking in industry and charity through sort of business development and stakeholder engagement. So the NIHR 
has strategic priority to support multiple long-term conditions research. And this has sort of grown over the last couple of years. And, and we work a lot in partnership with stakeholders across the system, other research funders, uh, HDR UK, as, as sort of Kamlish has mentioned. And, and what we did is to, to sort of look at some of the cross-funder framework work that had been done in collaboration with Academy of Medical Sciences and say, well, which bit of that is NHR responsible for or is in our remit? And we've published a quite top level strategic framework for multiple long term conditions research that we would really like to have our kind of pieces of work sort of anchored in addressing. Um, and obviously it's sort of in line with everything else that NHR does, which is to continue to to fund high quality research to provide an evidence base. Uh, a big part of that to date has been in, in identifying and mapping common clusters of disease and their trajectories, both uh, in collaboration with the Medical Research Council, but also through some funding that NHR has put into a program known as sort of artificial intelligence for multiple long-term conditions. Or We're also really keen to look at research, identifying the problems and outcomes that matter most to patients and carers and, and how they would like to see sort of services configured to meet their needs making sure that, that the research that we fund is looking at how we can enable the health and care system to, to take a more patient-centered whole person approach uh, to the treatment and care of people with multiple long-term conditions, and also to, to support the design and delivery of interventions that prevent patients progressing from, from one condition to the other. So very much in line with everything that sort of Chris previously said. But the second aspect of the work we've been doing is to really acknowledge that, that sort of cultural changes are needed within the funding system. And this has been acknowledged by a lot of funders that came together to form that sort of cross-funder group. And so we have groups across NHR that are actually looking at our systems and our processes through setting up uh, various task and finish groups to look at some internal processes. So for example, looking at our funding processes and our application forms, our guidance, our, the makeup of our panels, the kind of feedback that we give applications. So looking at projects, for example, whether there are common reasons for rejection for multiple long-term conditions or multimorbidity focused studies. So we can help the research community sort of uh, improve the quality of their applications, but also to sort of uh, apply or look at uh, having a multiple long-term conditions lens put onto a research project. Um, obviously looking at how we can engage with delivery implementation colleagues within NHS England, for example, to make sure that we can have our research pulled into practice, the findings. A big piece of work supported by our NHR Academy colleagues looking at how do we foster multidisciplinary workforces, how do we support the next generation of researchers to be able to work together. And later this year, the NHR Academy conference is, is focused on multiple long-term conditions, looking at how we can support and enable team science. Uh, very much in line with what everybody said, the need for this common terminology that we can use um, and sort of try and speak the same language and ensuring research trials do not unjustifiably exclude patients with multiple long-term conditions. In terms of the work that we've been doing uh, for quite some time across infrastructure, which is led by uh, Kamlesh and co-chaired with Professor Avon Ahiseya, who's the director of the Newcastle Biomedical Research Center, is trying to see how we can harness the power of what we have in our NHR infrastructure. So if you think of our infrastructure, there's a significant amount of funding put in annually. They are sort of tend to be block grants and they support thousands of researchers, support staff and clinicians across the system. So how do we harness that? Um, to, to actually come together to, to look at some of perhaps the more difficult questions that could only be done in a sort of multidisciplinary uh, collaborative nature. And, and so we're looking at scoping a, a multiple long-term conditions research infrastructure collaboration. What we don't want to do is to reinvent the wheel. We, we, we are very lucky that we come to this on the back of many other people doing really great work across the system to look at research priorities. So whether that's the sort of original um, multimorbidity priority for global health research, Academy of Medical Sciences report that was published in 2018, there have been um, at least two James Linda Lyons priority setting partnerships with, with some sort of area, one for older adults and one with complex health needs. Uh, the Richmond Group of Charities had a multimorbidity task force and have produced some, some Excellent sort of report. So what we want to do is to look at those and see what we perhaps as infrastructure could, could start to tap into. Um, so we've come up with a sort of vision of our research collaboration and the idea is to bring together the UK's translational applied and policy research infrastructure under this sort of an overarching collaboration to identify common research priorities 
to see how we can further encourage collaboration based on the shared expertise maximize the use of some of our existing infrastructure resources. Uh, as many of the collaborations we've previously built in, in perhaps single diseases, once established, they have quite a good chance of then leveraging additional funding because you've already pulled together the right expertise to, to, to apply to, to normal funding schemes, either at NHR or at other funders looking at attracting commercial and non-commercial partners that we could work with, and ultimately also building clinical and non-clinical research capability. So it is worth noting that we're in the early stages of scoping this, and it's, it's an ambitious program because it's the first collaboration that's ever looked to pull together the translational applied and policy research. So traditionally, perhaps collab collaborations have either been fully biomedical research centers, or in this case, applied research collaborations. And what we're trying to do is bridge everyone and include uh, a policy research unit and our three schools as well, which is public health, social care, and primary care research. So in terms of our phases of development, we have completed the first phase, which is to put together a collaboration development advisory group with um, just fantastic individuals that are in charge of their various bits of infrastructure and have all kind of very kindly kind of given their time and expertise. So as we said, directors of NHR infrastructure, but also some external colleagues that are helping us to shape it. So as Kamalish mentioned, Professor Bruce Guthrie is, is part of our collaboration development advisory group. Professor Gary Ford, who we will hear from later on, um, wearing his AHSN hat, helping us in HDR UK, but also some sort of interest from charities, such example, sort of British Heart Foundation, um, and also some of our pre-existing collaborations that are focused on single diseases and seeing how we can collaborate across the piece. So our next phase of, the, of development is really starting to further refine what it is that the vision and strategy of our, of our collaboration would do and support the identification of, of three to four areas where we think infrastructure working together could, could really add value and working in partnership with, with other interested parties ac across the system that we can do some good work with and ensuring that whatever we do, we make sure that it's embedded with, with good patient and public involvement and engagement. So we're really pleased that we have uh, a couple of patient and public involvement advisors on our advisory group who was sort of really integral in, in, in helping us shape what we're trying to do. Um, in the early stages of our, of our group, uh, we've actually started to um, look at what we think infrastructure working together might be able to look at. And, and we sort of started with some of these sort of suggestions, but, but as you can imagine, that's quite a lot to, to do. And, um, but they, they were looking at potential strategic priorities and areas of focus, looking at, for example, safer care, polypharmacy, communication breakdowns, which, which is often uh, happens with people with multiple long-term conditions because they're receiving care for multiple providers or clinicians. Um, something looking at perhaps people that don't traditionally get involved in research or perhaps there isn't very much research in that space. So for example, whether you're looking at people living in supported accommodation, not necessarily care homes, where perhaps there is very little data on their healthcare needs and how we can support them. Um, making sure that we look at care health and well-being, those in social isolation, those with learning disabilities, but also making sure that we, we make sure that we try and take a look at young people of young age or working age ad, adults. A lot of our funding traditionally, I think in the past, and a lot of the work is focused, uh, rightly so because of the accumulation of diseases in older age, but making sure that we try and take a bit of a life course approach. Uh, for now, we have um, excluded pediatrics only so that we can kind of make a start on something, um, but really acknowledging that within the wider piece at NHR, we, we do want to take a life course approach. Um, looking at service coordination and, and building on some of that common clusters of disease identification as those projects read out and, and methodology. So we obviously kind of went away after we kind of came up with that and also further refined that and started to group things together. And so we've kind of agreed that a lot top level priorities for this would be looking at models of care, which would then encompass some of this polypharmacy medication management, this interplay between physical and mental health and social care for those with complex health and care needs. And it was really um, felt that if we're going to sort of look at the what infrastructure could do, we probably needed to focus it on where multiple long-term conditions started to have an impact on day-to-day on -day life. Uh, second stream, looking at interventions, we think this is somewhere where that we, we could bring the expertise of the experimental medicine and applied research infrastructure together. Methodologies and, and, and obviously building on some of the really good work that others are doing around how we conduct research for people with multiple long-term conditions, looking at outcome frameworks and skill sets and the use of routine data. 
And really importantly, with some cross-cutting themes, looking at quality of life, addressing health inequalities and capacity building, whilst ensuring interdisciplinary research. So our next stage for that is to sort of pull that together into a, a, an application back to the Department of Health and Social Care to say there is buy-in and this is where we think that we, we could have value. Um, I've mentioned that a big part of what we want to do is to work in collaboration with, with, with others in the system. And I'm really pleased to say that the Association of with ABPI, the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry, is quite keen to work with us in this space because they have an interest in a multimorbidity interest group as well, an action group. And so we are looking at scoping uh, a, a, an industry workshop that we can pull together um, colleagues across academia and the pharma industry to see where we can collaborate in order to, to produce a pipeline of medication related innovations for, for multiple long term conditions. So we want to be able to showcase to industry, for example, some of the funding we've already put into identification of clusters of disease, when some of these are going to be sort of reading out, what does that mean for, for the development of, of medications or, or the system, looking at the exploration of trajectories to identify potential points, preventative therapeutic intervention and, and how that safety can be assessed discussing how you actually undertake trials and, and include and capture outcomes, including the collection of real world evidence, looking at clinical practice. So for example, prescribing adherence, how do you reduce inappropriate polypharmacy? A really important uh, aspect that we would really like to discuss and, and share sort of knowledge and, and is, is looking at how we can fill some of the skills and education gaps for those undertaking research in multiple long-term conditions. For example, is there an opportunity to upskill people through academ academia industry collaborations and identifying where we might need further methodological development to understand that. So um, the output of the workshop for us, certainly from our collaboration side, is to help define and scope the priorities of where this proposed NIHR multiple long-term conditions research collaboration could collaborate with industry to add identified areas. Secondly, to, to use it as an an opportunity to signpost existing resources within NHR, academia, the pharma industry that are available for collaboration. Um, and also to, I know ABP are really keen on this space to help refine areas where further policy work is needed to address gaps in, in drug discovery, R&D and, and licensing pathways for multiple long-term conditions. And then from our perspective, we would like to use this workshop as an opportunity to really learn how we can work with other types of industry and, and shape Program. So, for example, obviously this one's focused on pharma, but there's a real interest in what we can do with um, industry working in med tech, digital, because that's a huge uh, space that a lot of people with multiple long term conditions looking at self management as well. So, uh, that's everything I've got to say. Happy to take any questions uh, now or through the chat, um, or if anybody wants to sort of reach out to me, happy to kind of um, sort of arrange sort of follow on meetings as well. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Medina. Really great overview. As I said, you've been working tirelessly trying to gather all this information. Um, there's, there's a few questions maybe you want to answer in the chat. Um, I'll just take uh, one here um, uh, from Anna, who says, I'm curious to why you're using multiple long-term conditions instead of multi-mobility as terminology. Sure, absolutely. And this is something that we we talk about with the traditional world. So from, from our perspective, that's from patient and public feedback. So they've been really clear with us. They don't they don't like sort of the, the terminology of multimorbidity or being called multimorbid, as, as I'm sure we can imagine. But while ex while accepting that our research and clinical community often talk in that, so so NHR has tended to put multiple long term conditions, multimorbidity in brackets, um, and try to move the language perhaps to multiple long term condition. Thanks, Medina. There's there's a few on the chat as well. Uh, one from Tim Frailing regarding. Uh, focused uh, area of research on the shared mechanisms which MRC have funded and just sort of linking this with the translational work that uh, you've mentioned today. I think that was more of a comment. But uh, if, if there are some questions coming, if you can answer them on the chat, sure. please. Um, as in view of time, we'll, we better move on. Thanks again, uh, Medina. Um, so the, our next presentation is from Ash Routon from our team who will give an overview of the multi national multiple long-term conditions prioritization process, which was quite an interesting uh, process that uh, we undertook to prioritize the project. So, so Ash, over to you. Thanks, Kamlesh. And it uh, looks like I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see the slides okay? Yeah. Perfect. 
Okay, so good afternoon, folks. I'm going to uh, provide a, a brief overview of the ARC National Multiple Long Term Conditions Implementation Programme, a uh, bit of a mouthful. And the, uh, the process we underwent for selecting projects for funding, and I, I co led this work with the excellent Prof. Richard, uh, Professor Richard Baker, also at the University of Leicester. So as Camlish said um, in his earlier talk, this programme was one of seven national priority research areas across the 15 arcs, which was collectively awarded um, a total of around £13.5 million of funding uh, for a three year period by NHR last autumn. And for our particular theme, we received a, a £1.8 million pot. So the, the, the crux of our three year programme really is to try and identify and support the implementation of interventions to try and manage or uh, improve the management, um, sorry, to prevent or improve the management of, of people with multiple long term conditions. Um, but as an addition to this, we have a range of other things we'd like to get working on, such as uh, building a national community of multimorbidity researchers, improving researcher training opportunities, trying to get stakeholders and industry talking um, and working together a little bit better. And uh, there are a number of other things that aren't listed on the slide there. To guide the programme of work, we formed a national implementation group, which has represent representation from 12 of the 15 ARCs, HSN, Research Design Services, Midlands, AstraZeneca, um, and, and other folk. And once we'd formed this group and to start the, the three-year programme in earnest, and also to meet that core aim of supporting implementation of innovations, we released a funding call uh, in October of last year to all 15 ARCs. And what were we looking for? Well, we wanted applications that were focusing on the evaluation of implementation of interventions with evidence potential to reduce the burden of multimorbidity or to improve coordination between health and care services for people with multimorbidity. So really it was focused on generating the learnings needed to be able to scale up projects with potential. So we were seeking interventions that were ready for wider scale delivery, um, either across arcs, so across regions or, or indeed nationally. But the, the key stipulation with this funding was it shouldn't be used to undertake implementation or to fund the introduction of new services. It's purely for the evaluation of implementation. Ash, sorry, can you put on to um, uh, yeah. slide, slideshow, sorry. I'll just, I need to get rid of my face, that's in the way. Uh, that's yeah. it. wonderful, thank you. Okay, so yeah, um, so we're seeking interventions ready for wider scale delivery, the funding couldn't be used to undertake implementation, but we said also that there needed to be one or more provider who is already delivering the intervention or intended to do so. We wanted the involvement of more than one ARC region, so it was a nice opportunity for ARCs to use their existing resources and also where appropriate to pull resources from other ARCs. In the call, we said that we could only support between one and four implementation focused projects and with a maximum award for any project um, individually being half a million pounds. So we opened the call in October, it closed in early December, by which time we'd received nine applications from a total of seven ARCs and collectively uh, they were bidding for about 3.6 million pounds worth of funding. Pretty much exclusively all the studies focused on primary care and not surprisingly, if you give researchers a funding limit, most of the um, went up to the £500,000 limit. Now really on to um, the crux of my talk, which is the prioritisation process. To choose the applications for funding, we followed a, a systematic selection process broadly based on something called the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative uh, method. And this particular method was developed to address a need for setting priorities in health research investments in a, in a fair, transparent and systematic way. So we really wanted to be systematic and objective in our, in our selection method. I'm not gonna bore you with all the steps in the process, um, but I will highlight some of the key ones. Firstly, within our programme management group, um, we discuss and selected seven assessment criteria to judge these projects by. So we had things in there like, did they engage with service users to develop the project? Do they have the supporting infrastructure to deliver this? Do they address health equality? Is it likely to be affordable and cost effective? And so on. And then to match up to those seven assessment criteria, we developed 18 questions which would address that. Once we had though that selection criteria and questions, the applications were distributed to 79 reviewers to score against the selection criteria. Um, and this was done via an online survey. 
So each application was reviewed by at least five clinicians or academics, one research design service staff member, uh, and two members of the public, patient representatives, and Pauline, who's going to talk after me, um, was one of those reviewers. So that's, um, you know, that's a hell of a lot of reviewers, and to get that number, we asked each member ARC to suggest to reviewers um, from within their ARC, um, and we also took other recommendations and ensured that each application, um, there were no conflicts of interest, so we didn't assign people who uh, had an application within their ARC to uh, review a similar one. Reviews were completed um, in January and we calculated a, a priority score, which was a simple percentage value. But we also wanted to incorporate other people's views. So we had 25 stakeholders. So we had patient reps, NHS staff, HSN staff of, of varying um, levels of seniority, complete a, an online ranking exercise. So we wanted to get their views on the importance of the, the selection criteria, which the applications were judged on. From these scores, we calculated a weighting um, value, which could then be applied to the selection criterion. The weightings were then applied to those previously calculated priority scores. And so really what I'm trying to say is we ended up with a weighted score for all the reviewers being combined to create an average priority score for each application. And that meant we could rank order the projects and, and get a quick, easy way of being able to um, delineate the projects. And the nice thing I think about the process was that whatever way we cut up the data, whether we rank ordered by just the academics alone, the clinicians, the patient members, the RDS staff, um, there was quite a clear delineation between the top four and the rest. So a bit like the Football Premier League, top four and the best of the rest. Um, and actually it was the top four ranked projects which were selected for funding by the executive group because not only were they um, prioritised based on the scoring, that was the maximum number that we could fund with the available, pro uh, available funding. And I have the four um, studies up here so you can see two are led by um, ARC Oxford, one ARC West, one North Thames. I've listed the collaborating ARCs. Um, most of those are helping with implementation, but some are, are on there just for sort of perhaps a methodological support. Um, so I'll quickly run through some of the studies. The first one uh, led by Oxford, and that focuses on structured medication reviews and the impact of those on people with complex multimorbidity. The second one, also an, also an Oxford project, that's about implementing nice do not do recommendations for people with cardiometabolic multimorbidities. The third one, and I believe Rachel is, is talking a bit later on, not sure whether you're talking on this, Rachel, um, but that one's focused on a computer template to support personalised care for patients. And then finally, the fourth one, and I believe David Osborne um, is going to talk a little about these, the, uh, the Primrose framework. So that's interventions for people with severe mental illness and high risk for CBD conditions. And finally, as Camish mentioned, I haven't listed it here, but we also funded separately across project evaluation um, and that's more broadly going to work across the funded projects um, to focus on generating broader lessons for large-scale implementation um, of interventions to optimize care so i think that's me done that's my 10 minutes up thank you for the opportunity to present i hope i've given you an insight of the process we went through and i'm happy to answer questions um thanks very much uh, ash really grateful for not only the presentation but taking this work forward and how uh, you uh, saw this through uh, it was a huge amount of work but i think it worked really well it's, it just shows the input um that uh, our patient panel made to this uh, i'd like to thank them all as well and i think uh, because of that the, the the studies that were chosen were certainly uh, will make a difference to people with multiple long-term conditions um I haven't seen any questions, just a, a great presentation, Ash, from uh, 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 your team members. Um, uh, in view of time, I think we better move, uh, uh, but please do continue any questions you have for Ash on the chat as well. So I'm controlling, sorry to button camera, I'm controlling Pauline's slides. So oh, okay. Well, um, it's, a, it's great for us researchers to talk about multiple long term conditions, but the people who have to live with them on a daily basis and the research that we do matters the most for uh, the public and the patients and so i'm really delighted that pauline um, has joined us today uh, to give us the patient views on multiple long-term conditions thank you kamlish and thank you um for segueing into um that rich 
Um, and I'm really uh, grateful to be um, presenting um, on behalf of um, PPIE and on behalf of the uh, Community Voices panel within the RKM. Um, so we'll pop on to the next slide, please. Um, patient and public involvement and engagement. Um, I've chosen these two um, as I think the inception of service users, and there are many definitions, patients, public, et cetera, et cetera, and or carers um, from the onset of, of research um, is actually, it is paramount and, and the activity just embeds a core of, of why the need is evident. Um, we talk about, you know, people are, it is people reasons why we do research at the end of the day. They, they are at the starting point and they are at the end point and they really do need to be that golden thread throughout. Um, so the patient and public involvement and engagement, it really does provide those values and principles. Um, and yet we do not want to be professionalized um, because we have so many differing um, messages, but we need to, to maintain a key message and that balance of perspective. And that has to be a tangible benefit for everyone. Um, Ash has mentioned the, um, I, it almost sounds complexity of the, um, the study, and yet I felt it was actually really quite simple because I've chosen um, cheeses. Um, we've all played Trivial Pursuit, which is again a complexity, but um, in the simplicity of it, we are all sat around a table, we are all equal. Um, and that is what I believe PPIE should be. It should be equal. We all have a message. We all have a voice and we all feed into it. Um, and in this particular study, there were 21 questions um, that were centered in, within the PPI section. Um, and I really believe that that gave a consistent approach and also the confidence that the, the the people, I'm going to say the people that were filling in those forms, they were really having to look at the PPI section rather than just completing it. Um, and they were having to think about the study and how they were really going to focus on the PPI in, in, a, in, in a whole, really, as the study moved along. So it did give me confidence to, um, to ascertain what they were going to do rather than it just being a tick box exercise. And I can be quite harsh, I must say, in, um, in feedback and not just saying, yes, it's okay. Um, and I believe that's why the RKM um, is structured to ensure that PPIE is integral to every submission. Um, we have the scientific committee, nothing will go through without somebody, one of us has, has traced it and given it the seal of approval, let's say, from a PPI perspective. Um, so I think from moving on to the next slide, please, Ash. Um, with the next slide, it shows, I, I'm not sure whether you can see this clearly enough, but there is um, a way in which the PPI is moved through the cogs um, and it is, it's not just one voice, it is several voices. It, it includes the equality and the, and the diversity and, and the whole inclusion aspect. Um, and the community voices panel uh, partnership. It's also community partners panel. We have a very active center for BME health steering group, etc. So it try, it does cover as many angles as we as we can possibly do. Um, and the center is very well established um, within, within the arc. Um, next slide, please. And so it brings me on to multimorbidity. Um, <laughs> well, what is it? Well, to me, it's a, it's a very big, scary word. Um, and it is to the individual person. And I'm pleased to hear that maybe 
somebody's ahead of me for once in saying yes actually you know there is PPI already ahead here um, I think previous speaker said that NIHR are also adopting that change of stance into no we don't really like it it's multi multi long-term conditions um, I was a carer for my husband but my journey ended a long time ago but he had heart failure which that just in its own right was hard enough to establish and he collected many many conditions as you might imagine on the way um, to um, his his end result of um, leaving this world however when he was alive he used I used to say to him well how do you feel what how, how are you and his words were always I'm fine but was he fine how did it make him feel as a person? Um, you know, was he saying that I'm actually frightened, I'm isolated and I'm needing empathy? Do, how can we create that balance of understanding between the big words that you use as an organisational structure and how do we then create them into a balance that gives us as the person either living with them or caring for that individual? How do we create something that is purposeful for everyone? Can we do that? Is it possible? Or do we have to create a balance? And who, who creates that understanding? And I think where PPI comes in, that's where we can prepare for that change. We can balance that change. We can bring the elements of personalization into it. And we can develop the understanding within an organisational approach. And again, we can be a collective voice. We can remain professional without being professionalised. If that makes sense, I hope it does to everyone, because words really, really do matter. And they matter to everyone. I'm going to give you one last thought. Professor Chris Whitty used it, Camlish uses it, everybody uses it. But to me, a pathway is something I walk on outside. To you guys, it is something that you collectively use in clusters, in taking something to give credence to something brought together. I get that. But again, it's just understanding what different words mean to different people. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you get PPI and absorb it and take it forward for what it really means. Thank you. Pauline, thank you so much for that very heartfelt, very compelling uh, presentation uh, and, and bringing your personal aspects to it. Um, it's my pleasure. Any questions for Pauline before we move on to the next session? Paul, Pauline, I mean, you, you've been working with us for, for a number of years. In terms of how we should be working, do you have any other words of wisdom, how we can change? I mean, I know you've been instrumental in, in the work that we've done, but how can all of us work together? You know, there, there are thoughts about a national uh, multiple long-term conditions panel uh, as well, uh, and Donna's talked about it uh, previously for my team. It'd be good to get your insights into that. I think, like I've said, Kamlish, it, it is about us all having, I, I think it's respect for each other. Um, you know, you, Professor, Professor Whitty, you know, has a title. Um, I'm going to say something now, and I'm, I'm going to say, I have letters after my, my name, which um, was a biggest surprise of my life, I will say. But, but people that know me and in, in, in the field I was working at the time, they said, ah, yeah, but we really know what that stands for. And it stands for, for more, um, I'm going to say blooming earache. <laughs> you can fill your own blank in there. Um, but yeah, it, it it is having that respect for each other's um, understanding of how they fit into 
that uh, whether we call it a jigsaw or whether we call it the cheeses around the, um, the, the ring, I think we all have um, a voice and, and the lessons to learn and we can all learn from each other. And it's how we present ourselves. And I suppose that's what I'm saying about, I don't want to be professional in your world. Um, I, I don't want to be, I want to be professionally promoted to deliver um, what the people out there want to hear, you know, what, what they want to be presented. So I think, yes, as a national panel, um, I will still sit there, or I would still sit there and um, challenge whomever, whether it be Professor Whitty or Boris Johnson, or but do it in hopefully a, a, an appropriate way. You, you always do, Pauline. Um, <laughs> We've had a number of questions. I was wondering if you could answer them on the chat in view of time. I will do but, my best. Uh, I was just going to say uh, you definitely deserve the, the more blooming earache award. Uh, <laughs> well, well done for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. So we now come to uh, question. I, I think here it'd be great if people could just put on chat this questions and answer rather than question and answer because I have to move between the two. It'd be good if you can just put it on chat. How can we work together. Uh, again, the, the panelists, uh, please reveal yourself and, and give us comments if there are any. Uh, this is about how we could all work together as an ARC family. I have a, a couple of uh, uh, ideas. One, we're already working together. Uh, and I think the national priority funding, the seven themes that have been funded, and uh, we're working on the multi-mobility one, that certainly made us all uh, work together. A number of ARCs are working on those four projects that uh, uh, Ash mentioned. That, that's certainly one way. We know that AHSN, uh, uh, there's funding coming through uh, from the NIHR through to AHSN. That's another way that we've discussed at, nationally that we could work together. But it'd be good to get any other ideas that you may have. I'm going to if there's no question, I'm going to put some people on, on the spot here. Uh, maybe Gary bring you in. Sorry about this. Um, uh, if, if, if you have any, any thoughts about how we could work, and not, not just the ARC, but, but more widely, uh, such as AHSN as well. Um, I'll maybe start with thinking about certain um, common groups of patients and pathways. I mean, one example I'll mention later in my talk is, uh, it wasn't specifically a study around multimorbidity, but I think it has relevant insights in the stroke pathway. You know, people who are discharged as stroke survivors generally have multimorbidity. Not everybody, but the majority have multimorbidity. And, and there's been some interesting, uh, I would say, preliminary work which suggests approaches that might be helpful which lock into an existing pathway rather than trying to establish something completely new. So I think, I think one approach is to um, take some exemplar groups to start with. Uh, maybe as we've been trying to do in the um, TRE, you know, have different uh, inputs from the different stages of uh, research pathway. Um, you know, from the NHR infrastructure, so BRCs through to ARCs, through to HSNs, and just think of, of, you know, how we can answer some of the more fundamental questions, for example, about clusters, proteomic, genomic markers, but also at the same time, start to develop some service models which are needed now to help um, address the needs of uh, people with multiple long-term conditions. But I, I think that's probably a more pragmatic approach we can take now to starting to do work rather than saying, OK, let's let's go into primary care, which is completely overwhelmed, start a brand new program. Um, not saying we shouldn't try and do that where people have got the engagement, but we need to think about how we try and get some some rapid progress in some areas in terms of. Uh, you know, speaking to Chris's point, how do we actually move single disease focused pathways to be more responsive to the um, needs of the people in those pathways who have multiple conditions? 
Yep, thank, thanks very much, Gary. Um, and David, I'm not sure if you with us, uh, David Osborne, Professor David Osborne, and, and mental health is a key area um, for uh, people with multiple long-term conditions in the clustering, as we've heard earlier on. Um, any, any thoughts from you about how we could work together? Thanks, Cavanish. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, you put me on the spot now. I think certainly involving the people, which is obviously the primary care folk as well as the mental health folk in any um, of the projects, because you can pretty much guarantee that there will be very high rates of mental health um, challenges for people with multimorbidity. Um, I mean, one thing, I mean, Pauline, thank you so much for your talk, because it's so important, this business about language and about representation and the experience, really, of working with people from lots of different fields. And it just really resonated for me, actually. I was, I was thinking about the P word as well. Actually, I never use the P word if I can in my multidisciplinary teams, because it can be so off-putting <laughs> to people and, uh, and puts up barriers for me more than it um, makes both the people that I see clinically um, feel at ease, but also the people I work with in PPI. And I guess in terms of working together, I, I just thought these lessons that we learn, we all have, you know, we've had great PPI, hopefully in projects and programmes over the years, bringing together in terms of multiple long-term um, conditions, that, that learning, so it's not all happening in different silos, would be wonderful, I think. Um, you know, the stuff that I've learned both from family members and seeing them go through uh, dealing with different uh, silos in the health service but also their experience of what's good and what's bad um, in their experiences helps generate our research questions and learn so much so I would really like to see us really bring that together really all that learning. Great thanks very much so I think uh, again that this, this is one of the, the areas that we want to bring in at these meetings the shared learning. Um, I, I, I think all of us are getting really fed up of uh, virtual meetings, but hopefully yeah. we can have face to face. And, and this is, you know, I would have preferred to have a small groups working in this, in this, uh, you know, for, for these type of questions, but it's very difficult to run those um, in uh, large meetings like this. But let's hope that we, we can continue our, our shared learning, as you mentioned. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, David. Um, uh, there's some comments, one rep uh, from Anna, one reflection on how do we move from single disease to multiple long-term conditions focus in primary care would be related to the current setup of COF, um, since COF misses approximately one third of those uh, with multiple long-term conditions. As, and, and this is because, uh, as you know, there's a pay for performance, if th and those of you who don't know COF, and if patients are too ill or elderly, uh, we as general practitioners can just write them off and say it doesn't apply to them. Uh, it, they can be exempt from the uh, uh, denominator. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, alluding to that, that we, we do uh, miss out on approximately one third of people affected with this. So people who may be influential in the COF panels, if you're here, that's something that you may want to take forward. Um, I'm not seeing any more uh, uh, additions here. Um, one of the areas that I wanted to really bring up about working together is something that we heard uh, last week. We had the National ARC Directors and Program Managers meeting. And Elaine Hay, who many of you know, is the chair of the NIHR programs panel. <clears throat> and she came along and presented. And um, she gave a really good uh, overview and said she wants to hear from ARCs and she wants to work with ARCs and there could be a two-way uh, process where ARCs take projects to uh, the program grants and maybe the other way around program grants may come to ARCs and I thought that was a really good conversation that we had and one of the ideas was we have an enormous amount of expertise just the people here for example who are working in, in this uh, uh, arena in terms of multiple long-term conditions. And we should be uh, putting in, I think she's encouraging that, that we should be putting in program grants of uh, various ARCs working together. Obviously, uh, academic health science networks are, are well linked to all the ARCs. So, so they're also in the implementation stage. Um, and that's something I think as a, as, a, as a group that we should 
think about in the future and, and we're happy from our end to try and facilitate that if people do have ideas we'd be happy to bring a group together uh if, if there were a, a select you know a very very selective program grant type of proposals um we're also uh, happy to have our uh, ppi panel uh, you've heard from pauline uh, and the, the ethnic health center panel together for uh, uh, any PPI work that needs to do, particularly to ensure that we are not, uh, that we are inclusive as possible in, in terms of the, the, the wider populations. Um, if there is nothing else, Fionn, anything from you at all? No. Um, you're on mute still. No. Okay. Well, uh, for good behavior, instead of uh, five minutes, you have 10 minutes uh, of, a, of a break. Uh, uh, five minutes I thought was a bit too short to make a coffee and, uh, and uh, uh, use the, the, the boys' room. So uh, we'll meet again at 2.30 uh, sharp. Um, see you all soon. Thank you for all your contributions again. And, and it'll be Tom who'll be chairing the next session. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back. Um, so for the second part of the uh, the afternoon, um, first of all, we're going to hear from five uh, different uh, different arcs. Um, and as Kamlesh said before, these were chosen from different abstracts that were submitted um, to us. Um, you can find all those in the booklet. I will say that they were they were quite difficult to choose, but hopefully we tried to get a, a wide breadth of topics, um, as well as hearing from different um, arcs uh, across the, the country. Um, so we're going to start with Arc East Midlands and um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Patrick Hyton, who's going to give us an overview of um, the projects that we're currently run, running here in the East Midlands. Uh, Patrick. Right. Thanks, Tom. Let me just... Uh share my screen Is that coming through okay yeah great uh, okay so i'm just going to talk through a couple of our uh, kind of upcoming or in in, in preparation research uh, projects in our keys midlands Camus mentioned a couple of them before hence why he skipped over without going too much detail um so which uh, you'll have seen before, is relating to improving statin adherence and also statin prescribing habits in primary care using a package of text message reminders and um, also clinician training. And the other study I'll talk about today is uh, about reducing and potentially inappropriate medication prescription to uh, frail older people with type 2 diabetes. So the MedHealth study, as we all know, cardiovascular disease is a, is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, which is linked to um, LDLC, LDLC levels and driving cardiovascular disease events. And statins are the most common kind of class of drug prescribed to, to, to address this fact. However, we're all probably also aware that statin adherence is very highly prevalent. Um, and this reduces over time and is also impacted as you can see here by the kind of intensity of the treatment so those that are on a lower dose display even or a lower intensity display even lower adherence and this is obviously a problem because it impacts and, and, and negates kind of optimal clinical benefit of these prescriptions and also statins are quite often suboptimally prescribed so this is either not being prescribed at all when when the risk factors indicate that they should be or not on a high enough dose or treatment intensity or for instance, prescribing an older version of a drug due to clinical inertia or, or desires of patients when, when kind of contemporary guidelines suggest that they should be moved over to a more class of statin. Um, so our research plan in the MedHelp study to try and address these problems are firstly using the pre-existing text messaging systems that exist in GP practices already. Uh, that are used for things like appointment reminders or, or for instance, sending uh, reminders or invitations to JAB for, for vaccination appointments and things like that, to send a reminder and kind of motivational and educational text messages for to promote statin adherence. 
And the other element of the intervention will be to deliver kind of upskilling or training sessions to prescribers within practices in order to make sure that these contemporary statin prescription guidelines are being met. And this will be delivered using a pragmatic cluster randomized control trial delivered within primary care practices. So just a little bit more about the, the study design. So we'll be cluster randomizing to intervention versus usual care control practices, and we're looking to do this across potentially three or four arcs, depending on how recruitment goes, etc. And this, we're hoping to recruit a total of 40 practices, so these will be cluster randomized 20 versus 20, and we're looking for practices primarily with a list size of over 6,000. And we're hoping that this will result in roughly four and a half thousand patients meeting the defined eligibility criteria within these practices, which are 18 to 75 years of age, receiving a statin prescription for at least the last 12 months. The reason why we want at least the last 12 months is because then it becomes more of a reflection of true adherence rather than novel adherence within the, the immediate post-prescription or post-novel prescription period. And an LDLC level of over three millimoles per litre, as this indicates, uh, treatment non-adherence. And finally, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, or chronic kidney disease as a, as a long term condition. So, just a little bit about the intervention. We will be inviting uh, healthcare practitioners or, or people with prescribing responsibilities within each practice randomized to the intervention cluster to attend a, a webinar developed by our Eden team, which is Effective Diabetes Education Now team at the LBC. Um, to, to take part in a webinar all about contemporary statin prescribing guidelines and, and, and things of that nature. And we will send um, text messages to the eligible patients within the participating practices. We'll send them regular reminder text messages for 15 months. Uh, we've developed the content and the frequency and, and whatnot of these messages with, PP, with our PPI groups and also with experts at Manchester who have worked previously in, in using text message for this kind of behavioural change technique. Uh, and for our outcome collection, we will collect data from routine, kind of routine healthcare data from, from primary care records at zero, seven and a half and 15 months. And this is, will be facilitated by Primus, many of you probably know who are a data software a uh, company based at the University of Nottingham. And the primary outcome will be change in LDLC at 15 months. So this study, we are currently awaiting uh, confirmation of our REC uh, committee appointment. So we're, we're, we're pretty much there in terms of all the preparatory work going on. Um, so that's where we are with MedHelp. So DMED, it's a very, it's a very similar study uh, from, a, from a design and logistics perspective, hence why I'm presenting them both at the same time, um, but in a, an entirely different kind of clinical area. So as Kamesh mentioned, it's possible to over-treat patients, uh, particularly in, the, in frail older patients with type two diabetes, um, because these, these patients, Benefit, get as much benefit from really tight long-term risk factor control from uh, glucose lowering medications but they might be at great uh, increased risk of the adverse effects so um, hypoglycemic events and falls particularly in those who are frail and as we all know falls in those who are frail can really kind of initiate a cascade of negative health consequences that we'd really like to avoid so it's a bit of a a risk benefit analysis of what, what the potential expected gain would be from really tight risk factor control versus what, what you're actually risking uh, by, by um, prescribing these medications. And also when, you're in, when you have multiple long-term conditions, which the majority of these patients do, there's also a lot, a lots of issues around medication interactions and adverse events and medication adherence and polypharmacy as well. So the aim of the DMED intervention will be to try and reduce these potentially inappropriate medications uh, intensity in these patients. So the, the broad research plan will be to evaluate or develop and evaluate an intervention which, which supports healthcare practitioners to confidently and appropriately de-intensify medication when it's, when it's appropriate and when it's needed in these patient groups. So this will be through, uh, through clinician training, again, developed and delivered by the Eden team at the Leicester Diabetes Centre and investigated in a cluster randomised pragmatic uh, RCT, just like the MedHelp study. So again, very similar to MedHelp, we're looking to run intervention versus usual control practices 20 apiece across three or four arcs. 
uh, with a list size of four to 12,000 in this case, these would be cluster randomized. Uh, and based on eligibility criteria, we're hoping this will result in about 1,500 eligible patients, which in this case is aged over 65 or greater than over 65, diagnosed type 2 diabetes, with an HbA1c under 7%, so they're reasonably well controlled, so we're not going to be putting anybody at, ri at real risk by de-intensifying glucose-lowering medications. Obviously, they need to be prescribed diabetes medications and score moderate to severe on the electronic frailty score, which is a composite score put together by a kind of primary care records to indicate degree of frailty. So the intervention will consist firstly of a, an electronic decision support system. So this will have a patient uh, identification system, a two-part system developed and installed by Primus, which will be um, pop-up or alert reminders when people who are potentially eligible for de-intensification come in for a routine appointment or a kind of ad hoc search system if you're looking to identify patients uh, who are potentially eligible for de-intensification. And then we'll deliver a webinar concerning medica medication de-intensification to these practices. Similarly, as before, we're looking for at least two um, prescribers per participating practice. This will also be supported by a three month performance review, which will be delivered by the clinical advisor that delivers the webinar in order to make sure that practitioners or prescribers within the participating practices are, are happy and feel supported with what's going on. We can um, have a look at whether or not the appropriate amount of the intensification has occurred or not. And also uh, this advisor will be available by email and, and a helpline um, to these practices whenever they might have any worries or questions about medication de-intensification. Uh, we'll extract uh, routine primary care data at 0, 6 and 12 months for our outcome data collection. And the primary outcome in this case is proportion of patients 12 months who, who have had a potentially inappropriate medication de-intensified. Study has received spots of green light, and we're now in the process, hopefully, of recruiting practices. Uh, so that was just a very kind of whistle-stop tour through those two projects. If you are from an ARC that you think might be interested in taking part, please get in touch. If you contact me for the MedHelp study or Joe Byrne, who is kind of running the DMED study, please, you know, please get in touch, um, and we'll talk about more about what's required. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, really great. Um, we've got a couple more minutes for some questions. Um, there was a couple in the chat, and I have one myself, um, but I'll go for the chat ones first. So there was one from Joyce who said, um, I think this was for the MedHelp study, why is there a cutoff at 75 years? So the cutoff is because at this stage we're looking, we're looking to potentially you're looking at the threshold where intensification versus de-intensification becomes a decision. Uh, we, we don't want to be really intensifying medications over a certain age because, as I mentioned, they they may these patients may be more or less likely to really see the long-term benefit of risk factor control, but potentially more likely to have issues with multiple medications or any adverse effects. So the idea being that we're, we're looking to really increase the type risk factor control in those that will benefit the most and have the, have the, the lowest risk, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. Um, there was another one as well um, about excluding type one diabetics and, and why in, uh, I think this was MedHelp as well, why you've chosen to exclude type one diabetics from the study. It's mostly just numbers uh, and um, interactions with kind of chronic disease treatment really is the, is the solution, but I'd, uh, I'll have to look back through the exact protocol to give you a firmer answer for that. Um, and a couple more in the, in the chat. Um, well, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, are there any other patient related outcomes being looked uh, in either study, um, particularly the deep prescribing study? So what are the main um, outcomes? I can't remember the other main outcomes off the top of my head for DMED, apologies, that's Joe's study as opposed to mine. Uh, I can tell you about the MedHelp um, study. Uh, the, so obviously the primary outcome is LDLC, but we've got medication adherence as another key outcome. It's particularly difficult to measure, which is why it's not the primary outcome. 
Um, and we've also got cardiovascular disease events, uh, other markers of um, lipids, so HDLC, triglycerides, things like that. Um, I'll have to double check for the for the DMA outcomes. I apologise. And one one for your stats brain, Patrick. Um, oh, the no. Med Health oh, no. study has a um, large total sample size. Is this because you're answering multiple questions, or are we? going to be looking at uh, a relatively small effect size uh, in the primary outcome yeah, what was primary yeah. Outcome? The, the primary outcomes are ldlc so yeah. yeah that's exactly why it's a it's a it's a we need more sensitivity basically yeah um uh, the other thing is i mean there's more patients that satisfy this criteria also so it, it does work you know it, it works out in that in that way and one very quick one, this one kind of related to what I wanted to ask actually about the actual text message themselves um, and about, I mean, text messages, I don't want to say an outdated form of communication, but certainly not as used as widely as it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, I just wondered about your thoughts about not everybody having kind of access or using text messages as much as other forms of communication. Yeah, so we, um, this is something we looked into a lot when we were doing the kind of PPI preparatory work to say, is this a suitable, um, a suitable method of communication? And the, the, the main driving factor behind it was that this is the system that exists already in most GP practices. So we, will, we won't be rewriting the, or reinventing the wheel for these practices. The idea is to slot in as, as uh, seamlessly as possible to routine practice. So we will kind of piggyback on the on the pre-existing systems that GP practices use already, partially in order to, to, to mimic exactly what this kind of service would look like in real life if it was implemented, and also partly just to reduce any kind of barrier to entry for the practices. Hence, hence why we thought that the text messages, despite having certain limitations, which you mentioned, were, were the, the best route forward. Great, great. Thanks very much, Patrick. Um, so moving swiftly on. Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Rachel Johnson um, from the University of Bristol, uh, and she's from Arc West, and she's going to be talking about how um, their projects are improving experiences in primary care for people with uh, multiple long term conditions. Um, Rachel, over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Okay, so I'm Rachel Johnson. Oops, I'm a, a GP in Bristol and I'm also a lecturer in primary care at the University of Bristol. And I'm presenting today on behalf of my team, including a couple of people who are in the audience, I think Chris Salisbury and Cindy Mann. And I'm gonna tell you about three projects that we've got for people with multiple long-term conditions. We have lots of other projects, but I'm gonna focus on three today. And they all address this problem, which is that people with multiple long-term conditions tell us that their care is fragmented, that it's not particularly well integrated, and that it doesn't address the priorities that patients have. And the, one of the main aims of the NHS, NHS personalized care agenda is that healthcare addresses the problems that patients identify themselves. So it, it's, it addresses what matters to them. And we've been doing quite a lot of work talking to healthcare professionals. This has included GPs, it's included uh, pharmacists and nurses, and they all tell us that they really value providing personalized care, but that within current healthcare systems, they struggle to provide it. Um, partly they have lots of competing priorities, but there are lots of other ways in which the structure in which they work makes it difficult to provide personalised care. And we know that healthcare systems and processes tend to support care that fo that's focused on single health conditions rather than multiple health conditions. And people with multiple long-term conditions describe that they often experience high treatment burden, and that's not necessarily just related to the tablets that they take, but other things, for example, trying to access appointments or to get hold of repeat prescriptions. So we've, I'm going to talk about three studies. The first two of those build directly on previous experience from the 3D trial. So the 3D study was led by Chris Salisbury and was published in The Lancet in 2018. And it was a cluster randomized control trial of an intervention to support patient-centered care for people with multiple long-term conditions. 
The 3D intervention included care and support planning within whole person comprehensive reviews. So we're going to build on the work of 3D. We're including the things that worked well in the 3D study and we're addressing some of the challenges that were uncovered in the 3D study. The 3D study showed that a patient-centered care model can improve self-management and the sense of choice and control that patients have over their care. But the study didn't show any impact on quality of life or disease outcomes. And one of the key challenges that were uncovered by 3D is the challenge of implementation and healthcare system change for an intervention such as this. So with the Year of Care partnerships, we've been developing an intervention called Maxwell, which builds on previous work of Year of Care, and, but also um, builds on the 3D study as well. Um, Year of Care have extensive experience of training practices and supporting them to develop systems to provide care and support planning and supporting the implementation of care and support planning. And, Max, and Maxwell has patient-centered care and support planning within comprehensive reviews and also attention on how to change systems and implement uh, these changes. We've got two linked studies which, which look at this, and they are PP4M and MAP, which I'm going to describe for you now. So first of all, personalized primary care for people with multimorbidity. And this is one of the cross arc collaborations that was funded that we heard about earlier in Ash's talk. And this particular study takes a, a specific part of the 3D intervention, which was a template. So when most people have an appointment with a nurse or a pharmacist or a GP in primary care, often the, the healthcare practitioner is using a template. And that template is used to structure the information that they collect during that consultation. And that information can then be coded and it can be accessed at a later date more conveniently. And this provides an opportunity both to try and prompt care so that certain things are covered because they're prompted on the template, but also potentially it could focus the consultation in a specific way which, which might not align with what the patient wants to address as a priority, for example. So this study, PP4M, focuses on that template and how we might be able to use it to support personalised care for people with multiple long-term conditions. We know that the templates work to some extent. We have, they worked in the 3D study. So in this study, we're further developing those templates. And we're also then focusing on implementation by developing an implementation package as part of the study, which we will then evaluate. And this is a cross arc collaboration. And on the slide there, I've listed the other arcs that we are working with, Arc West, West Midlands, Wessex and Penn Arc, we are part of Arc West, and uh, the co-investigators are listed here. So a little bit about the template that we're using in this study. And at the top there, I've put what, what it starts with. So it starts with questions about what's most important to the patient. So the idea of this is that we will try and nudge care towards focusing on that question. But the template also then covers all the things that need to be covered, best practice review of common conditions. It focuses on the areas that I've listed here that we know are particularly important to people with multiple long-term conditions. It's comprehensive um, and it supports social prescribing and shared decision-making. And it leads on to the development of a care and support plan with, which would focus on the agreed goals and priorities of the patient. And in this study, we also are providing support to use the templates, including identifying people with multimorbidity, as well as training and technical support. And we're going to evaluate the implementation. So we're working with ARCs. We've also been discussing with our CCGs more recently with integrated care systems, also the AHSNs in, in the different regions. And as part of this study, we are also working with the Keel Impact Accelerator Unit to also have a, a wealth of expertise in implementation, as do many of the ARCs involved in the study. And the study is going to focus on inequalities, and we're going to do that by trying to recruit practices in areas of socioeconomic deprivation. We'll then be evaluating the implementation in 24 practices, and we will begin that early next year. We're going to use mixed methods um, and those mixed methods are going to include qualitative interviews with patients and with healthcare professions, observations of consultations. We have implementation questionnaires for um, healthcare professions. And also we will be using questionnaire data pre and post uh, the consultations for patients as well. And we'll also be looking at routine healthcare data. 
And the other study that we have ongoing, which also builds on the experience from 3D is the Maxwell in pilot practices uh, study. And this is led by Cindy Mann, who is here in the audience. So this again uses the Maxwell intervention and we're collaborating with our local CCG and also again with year of care partnerships. And in addition to the template that I've already described very briefly, practices in this study will also have access to training from year of care partnerships. And the USB of MAP is that it's going to co-produce how Maxwell is implemented in order to meet the needs of people with multimorbidity in areas of deprivation. And to do this, we're going to engage and involve the local communities in three practices in areas of deprivation. And we're going to work with them to establish community members in, who will co-produce alongside the GP practice how to implement the Maxwell reviews in their practices. And then we are going to evaluate that co-produced implementation of Maxwell. And again, this will be a mixed methods evaluation with interviews of staff and patients, as well as PROMs, patient reported outcome measures, which will be collected before and after the reviews and some routinely collected data to look at service use, which will be collected from the medical records. And the third study, which is not directly linked to 3D, but links into a lot of the priorities that have been discussed previously, is looking at treatment burden in people who are under the age of 65 who have multimorbidity in primary care. So we know that a third of people, approximately a third of people with more than four conditions are actually under the age of 65. But as was pointed out earlier, less of the research has focused here. We also know that this is a particular problem in areas of deprivation. So multimorbidity occurs a lot earlier in more deprived areas, and this contributes to health inequality. I've mentioned before that people often experience treatment burden from multimorbidity and primary care has the potential to influence the burden that people experience, but also potentially their capacity to manage that burden. And this is the area that, that this study focuses on. This is a mixed method study and we've got four main research questions. So the first looks at how, the treat, how treatment burden impacts on people of working age with multimorbidity. And we're going to start to address this with qualitative interviews with those patients. The next two questions, how is the experience of primary care associated with treatment burden? And can treatment burden be assessed in routine general practice using a brief measure which is valid and reliable so that we can identify people who are at risk of experiencing high treatment burden and we can understand how primary care, how primary care can affect that. To do this, we're going to use a cross-sectional questionnaire, and the cross-sectional questionnaire is going to be designed following on from the qualitative interviews. And then the final question is, what opportunities have we got to reduce treatment burden and enhance people's capacity to manage that burden for multimorbidity? And to do that, we're going to use co-production workshops. So here we're going to bring together patients with multiple long-term conditions, with healthcare professionals and providers of services to understand the implications of our findings from the previous two stages of the research. And that was all I was going to share, thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, is, if anybody has any questions, then feel free to put them in, in the chat. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for some questions if anybody wants to ask them. If not, I'll ask one, if that's okay. Um, so I think one of the problems certainly that I often think about is implementation and I quite like the, some of the ideas that you talked about about how you're going to actually evaluate the implementation in practice um, I noticed you had normalization process theory up there as well could you just expand about what that actually means and how you fit that into some of the implementation kind of practices that you're doing yes yeah, so we're going to use normalization process theory to as an overarching theory, both to help us design our implementation package and also to help us evaluate it. So normalization, normalization process theory is a theory which helps us to understand how practices are adopt, how practice, new practices are adopted. So it looks at, um, for example, whether what you are, the, the thing that you're trying to change, the thing you're trying to get healthcare professionals to, whether it fits, but it has coherence for them. So whether it fits with their views of themselves as, a, as professionals, for example, and it fits with what they understand about their role. 
Um, and there's various stages to normalization process theory. So that's just one example, but we'll, we'll take those different things and we will use that to understand how, so following that example through. So if we want to make sure that this gets implemented, we want to make sure that it fits with our health healthcare professionals understanding of what their role is, that the template fits those values. We've been doing that work, as I said, we, with this strong support for personalized care. So we need to draw out when we, in our implementation, we need to make that evident to healthcare professionals that this, that this fits with their value system, for example. And then we will also use it to structure our our evaluation as well. So we will look at those elements of normalization process theory when we look at our quantitative interviews, etc. So yeah, that's basically how it will work. I've only seen it as a complicated diagram written down. Oh. <laughs> um, just one more question. There are some more questions in the chat, so hopefully you'll be able to just you can type those. Um, the first one was from Hannah, which I'll come um I'll ask is uh, she says um, are you going to use any specific methods to recruit people from more social and economic deprived areas? Um, so we've got lots of different studies. Uh, we, we talked about different studies, um, and so they will all build on that. I mean, we have a we have a lot of expertise in in Bristol in doing this, and we're beginning to develop more expertise. We all already have a really well established PPIE group and they are working hard to make sure that we have more representation on that group from people in deprived areas. We have good engagement in Bristol from research practices in socioeconomically deprived areas and so we are in our recruitment we are targeting those to to do that um, and in Cindy's project specifically she's going to find community members which is a model that we've used before to go into the communities and find members of those communities. So for example, in some of the work we've done in more ethnically diverse populations that might have included going to mosques and things and getting those community leaders to help us to um, get uh, practices into our study. So a range of methods, which we're still working on in all honesty, we're, 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 we're at the, the early stages of both of these studies, um, but those, but really, I think it's about going into the communities, identifying community leaders and using those. And we have lots of networks that we're beginning to establish to, to help us do that. We also, I should say, working with Kiel, who have, again, a lot of resources that we can, we can use and learn from in this area. They do a lot of this type of work and they have specific groups looking at how to recruit from, from these areas as well. Great. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, wish you the best of luck with those projects. Thank you. Um, so the the third, I should say, set of speakers next, I think, um, is Lisa Brighton and uh, Marion Summerfield, um, who are from ARC South London, uh, and they're going to be talking about research with people who have multiple long-term conditions and recommendations from a public involvement workshop. So Lisa and Marion, over to you. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen and I'll just confirm that you can see my slides in a moment. And can I check, Marion, are you with me? I certainly am. Perfect. Um, can you confirm that you can see the slides okay? Yep. Yep, I can. Brilliant. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Lisa Brighton and I am a researcher from the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London. And I'm co-presenting today with one of our patient and public involvement members, Marion Summerfield. And hello everyone, my name is Marion Summerfield. I've contributed to the public involvement work at the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's for quite a few years now, and I believe in the fundamental importance of PPIE when researching healthcare. And so today we're going to be sharing um, some suggestions and recommendations from a public involvement workshop that we conducted earlier this year. And um, we hope this will actually build quite nicely on Pauline Mountain's excellent talk earlier, and especially where she talked about how patients and families and members of the public are a golden thread through what we're doing in research. Now, before we get into the meat of it, um, I just think it's very important to say that we are presenting here on behalf of a wider team. And this work involved us coming together across multiple themes of our applied research collaboration in South London, including people working mm -hmm. in our palliative and end of life care theme, our public health theme, and also our social care theme. Now we know, especially from what Chris Whitty was saying first thing, that people living with multiple long-term conditions have not always been fully included in health research. 
and historically a lot of our work as researchers has focused on single conditions. As this shifts and we find ourselves working more and more with people living with multiple long-term conditions, both as public advisory members, but also as research participants, we wanted to make sure that our research practices are being considerate and inclusive of their reality and their lived experience. Um, I know from first-hand experience how important it is to provide a safe space for people, uh, especially when they're being talked to about difficult physical and emotional issues, or even the frustrations of managing the logistics of their health care. When people feel safe, they then feel comfortable talking about their lived experience. When that happens, sometimes even the simplest observation or the smallest nuance that a person shares can inform and enhance the research, which then serves others in future care. So we wanted to open up an opportunity for two-way dialogue between our researchers and people who are living with or supporting a friend or family member with multiple long-term conditions. And the aim of our workshop was to learn more about how we can best work together with people with multiple long-term conditions in our research. This includes collaborating as partners in research, so for example in public involvement activities. It includes supporting their participation in research studies and also ensuring research makes a difference. So thinking about how we can work together to ensure that our research really leads to change. To do this, we planned a two hour public involvement workshop hosted on Zoom uh, based on a format that we've used successfully for other public involvement workshops within our local palliative care theme. We provided space for in-depth discussions by splitting out into three groups based on those bullet points. And we had in-depth discussions in our smaller groups for the first half of the workshop. And then we brought everyone together again for a whole group feedback and discussion for the second half of the workshop. We took detailed notes throughout and we wrote up a summary of this after the workshop. We then circulated this summary to the workshop participants for further comments, mainly to make sure that we hadn't missed or misunderstood anything. We had nine researchers and 17 members of the public affected by long-term conditions at the workshop. And this slide shows six key recommendations or suggestions that came out of the workshop. I'll hand over to Marianne first to speak to the first three of these. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Right, I'll go through the first three recommendations on the top row. The first one is, ask people what they would like research on. People living with multiple long-term conditions may have specific research questions that they would like to be addressed. If something isn't working for them, then this is where they can raise the issue. Just being able to ask it within a piece of research means knowing that your needs have been acknowledged. Participants also spoke about the importance of involving people with multiple long-term conditions early on in research design to ensure projects are relevant and that it reflects their own experience and their own needs. They also asked researchers that they're clear about the following issues within a research project. One, the time commitment required. Secondly, what reimbursement was being offered. Thirdly, that researchers keep them up to date on the progress of research, research applications. There is nothing more frustrating, um, and I know from personal experience, there is nothing more frustrating after agreeing to contribute to a research proposal and then never hear back from the researcher and wonder what happened to it. So please note, this is a, an aid memoir and um, hopefully we're all moving forward with this work. The second point is be compassionate and flexible. Individuals with multiple long-term conditions may have several personal and care, care commitments that they have to manage. Having to deal with the logistics of healthcare appointments can be tiring in itself and add to the strain of managing their conditions. So these need to be taken into consideration when researchers plan meetings. Participating in research and sharing experiences about your illness can be both physically and emotionally draining. And revisiting a particular experience can trigger an unexpected response. Therefore, compassion, patience, understanding and respect for each person are of primary importance. Some suggestions to manage these scenarios were, one, in order to accommodate individuals existing personal and healthcare commitments, researchers should look to offer arrange and arrange meetings outside of the nine to five working day. 
Secondly, acknowledge any and all levels of contribution to ensure that every person's experience is heard. And thirdly, have a consistent person to contact uh, who communicates clearly and responds in a timely manner to alleviate any concerns. And then moving across to the third point, make space for discussing prior negative experiences and building trust. People living with multiple long-term conditions may have interacted with various health and social care professionals and possibly research teams in the past. Not all these experiences will have been positive. That came out in the workshop. Carers, including family and friends, may also have been forgotten about and or overlooked. They are an integral part of the support team and they need to be included and they need to be respected as well. Participants felt we should aim to create a safe and supportive environment which is empathetic and sensitive to the needs and experiences of those with multiple long-term conditions. They also suggested it's important to acknowledge the fundamental role of carers and need to be aware um, within research activities that this might be upsetting for them as well and therefore for researchers be prepared to support them too. I'll hand back to Lisa for the next three points. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. So the fourth recommendation was about making sure we understand and address diverse experiences of exclusion. One really helpful example here was that people at our workshop noted that individuals living with multiple long-term conditions might self-exclude from research studies if they're not sure that one of their conditions is compatible with taking part. So making it really explicit that people can still participate even when living with multiple additional conditions can be really important. They also noted that, particularly with the changes that we're seeing in research practices as a result of COVID-19, that we need to be particularly conscious of the risk of digital exclusion and make sure that we're offering flexible options for communication. And this means ensuring that sufficient time and resources are allocated to this from the start. The fifth recommendation was something I hadn't really thought of as a researcher. Participants suggested that we think about how we might create opportunities for people to socialize. Our workshop participants felt that people with similar experiences and in similar circumstances could potentially benefit from interacting socially. And sometimes public involvement or research participation can provide these opportunities. This may help to build a support network amongst those with multiple long-term conditions and might encourage them to stay engaged with research. So examples included building social time into our public involvement meetings, or another example was offering ways for participants to connect with one another following taking part in a research study. The final suggestion from the participants in our workshop was about using the arts to support communication. The individuals affected by multiple long-term conditions in our workshop described how they would often get provided with lots of quite text-heavy information from health and social care services, for example, in letters or information sheets about their care. So when we're approaching people about research or involvement opportunities, using alternatives like pictures and animations and videos would be a very welcome break from this. Now, altogether, for our researchers, this was a really helpful opportunity to receive feedback and advice from people affected by multiple long term conditions. Now, there's lots of core kind of principles you can see underlying these recommendations, and they're all things we're familiar with. It's things about creating relationships and thinking creatively and being flexible in our approaches. But what this workshop also did was show some of the really specific ways in which the reality of living with multiple long term conditions can affect people's um, ability or experiences of engaging in research. The examples we've given will by no means be exhaustive, but hopefully they're helpful as a starting point for reflection and ongoing dialogue. And as David Osborne was saying earlier, shared learning about how we might make our research practices more inclusive for people who are living with multiple long-term conditions. Yes, I agree, Lisa. Um, in conclusion, I was very glad to be part of this workshop. Um, I know firsthand again how this works and it was, uh, it was a very positive experience for everyone involved. Uh, we covered a broad range of some quite challenging issues associated with multiple long-term conditions and endeavored to provide a really supportive environment where people felt comfortable and safe to participate and learn by sharing their experiences with each other and with the researchers. Um, I want to finish by noting the remarks of one participant they had had a difficult experience in primary care 
and because of this were wary of joining the workshop. But at the end, it was clear they not only felt heard and listened to, but they said how much they'd enjoyed being part of the discussions. And that um, is a good reflection for the work we're all trying to do together. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. And if you'd like to hear any more after today, um, please feel free to get in touch with our team. Thank you very much. And we'll be happy to answer any questions now and in the chat. Thanks both. A really great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it, yeah, look, like they've said, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat. There's probably time for one or two, if anybody can get them in quickly. Uh, just while we're waiting then, uh, I have a quick one. Um, in your group, I think there were 17 um, people living with different conditions. Um, did you get any feel for any kind of differing opinions with people with different kind of um, patterns of disease or different clustering of disease? Or is there any kind of difference in the, their thoughts or feelings around what you did? Um, so this this wasn't something we particularly explored, I guess. If we'd have been doing this as more of like a research study, one of the things we might have done was kind of collected some um, kind of participant characteristics in more detail and got a really thorough understanding of who's living with particular conditions. Um, so my effect on the workshop is that there were a lot of, there didn't seem to be any, any kind of condition specific patterns that were coming up, at least in the discussions that we were having. And a lot of these were kind of broad themes that seemed consistent across people's experiences. Um, Marion, I don't know if you have any different reflections from that. Well, not specifically to Tom's question, so, but it's at a tangent, but it's really supporting what you said earlier in our presentation that I can only concur with the, the, the presentation that Pauline gave. Um, and it's relating to how we deal with people who are trying to contribute to the research is that language is so important. Mm. You know, somebody early on asked today, why are we using MLTC instead of MM? Well, there's a reason. Um, I know it's a clinical term, MM, but how you talk to people with the very condition, multiple long-term conditions, it's important how words are used because that affects how they manage their own healthcare. Um, so I feel quite passionate about it. So excuse me interjecting now, but while I have the opportunity, I just want to, from my perspective, not having MLTC, but seeing how research works within these workshops and the work that CSI does, and it's important. That's, that's really what I wanted to say to completely back up what Pauline said. The voice of the, per, the people going through these conditions needs to be respected and the language that's used is so important. I'm sure you'll agree, Lisa, because we work together and we know how important it is. So mm -hmm. thank you for letting me say that. But while I have the opportunity, I wanted to just bring it to the fore. Thank you. No, not at all. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we'll we'll move on. But I think there is some questions in there, the chat for you both. Um, Perfect. So feel free Thank to ask. Thank you. Um, so moving on then. So the next uh, speakers are Dr. Tom Woodcock and Darren Lovett, uh, both from Imperial College in London. Uh, and they're representing ARC Northwest London. And they're going to be talking about clustering multimorbidity in patients hospitalised with COVID-19. Uh, over to you both. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see our slides. Let me get that. There we go. How's that? Do you see the slides? Yep. 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 Great. OK. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Tom Woodcock. I'm a senior research fellow at Imperial College London um, in Arc Northwest London. And we're going to talk to you today about our work clustering multimorbidity, um, a pilot study in patients hospitalised with COVID-19. Um, I'm going to hand over to Darren so he can introduce himself and kick us off. Hi, uh, so my name is Darren Lovett um, and I am the GIS analyst at ARC Northwest London um, within the Information Intelligence team. So this um, is a joint piece of work between uh, our theme and the multimorbidity theme at ARC Northwest London. So um, starting off, Tom, you've got to click through the slides for me. Yeah, perfect, thanks. So um, 2018 research priorities from the Academy of Medical Science and Multimorbidity work to identify multimorbidity clusters with the greatest burden, determinants of most common clusters, and prevention strategies to reduce the risk of development of these common clusters, which the NIHR's multiple long-term condition multimorb multimorbidity framework um, is built upon. So some existing work focuses on index conditions and also derives clusters empirically, but does not always take advantage of the connected nature of long-term conditions through hierarchical networks of clinical diagnoses, 
codes like the international classification of diseases. Um, an unsupervised approach to clustering, clustering is well suited to take advantage of the relationships between these diagnoses. And the Northwest London Discover data, which we use in this project, is a large integrated individual level data set covering 2.3 million residents of Northwest London currently registered with a GP. Um, and it comprises linked data on primary, secondary and tertiary care, community and mental health care, emergency departments and social care, and therefore is ideal for applying these clustering methods at a population level. Today we are going to share with you a pilot analysis of a thousand patients submitted to hospital in Northwest London with COVID-19. So using methods from a 2019 paper by uh, Gia et al, um, we want to cluster people together according to how similar their diagnoses are. So every clustering algorithm starts by defining the idea of similarity. To measure how similar two sets of diagnoses are, we start from how similar two individual diagnoses are. Um, we can do this by using how close together they are in a clinical coding hierarchy. And you can think of this hierarchy as a family tree in the sense that two individual codes uh, are close together if they are more closely related. Um, so therefore they have a common ancestor who is fewer generations away. For example, atrial fibrillation is more similar to chronic heart disease than depression. So now that we have explained how we can measure between two individuals, we can apply this to a sample of people. When we run this measure across all the pairs of people in our sample, we can represent this information in a dissimilarity matrix. And this matrix is then used to actually group people into clusters. The more similar people are based on their clinical diagnoses, the more likely they are to be put into the same cluster. Once we have these clusters, we can then check the validity and analyze the characteristics within and between clusters. For example, describing each cluster's demographics, diagnoses, care pathways, and health outcomes. This method is uh, computationally challenging um, on large populations. So as a pilot, we've applied this to a sample of 1,000 hospital admissions of COVID-19 between February and October, 2020. We used the first admission for each patient and took the set of clinical diagnosis codes for that admission, except the COVID code itself. Because hospital data codes, not only for the reason the patient was admitted for, but pre-existing comorbidities, we can use this data to get an understanding of multimorbidity clusters in those people hospitalized for COVID-19. We applied the described methods to these 1,000 patients, which represent half a million pair of patients, and use the ward linkage method to create the clusters. For each cluster, we are able to describe the diagnosis frequency, demographics, length of stay, and in-hospital mortality. And I'm going to pass you back to Tom, who's going to talk us through some of the results. Thanks, Darren. Um, so uh, for one of the admissions, we only had the COVID code, and so that one was excluded, and the analysis proceeded with the remaining 999. We used this sort of um, heuristic method for picking the number of clusters, which people who've done clustering work might have heard of, the elbow method. Um, many of the clustering methods don't kind of tell you what the best number of clusters is. So these, this is an alternative that gives you an idea of um, where to look. So we, we ended up looking at six different clusters in our data. Uh, and those six clusters had between um, 53 and 324 admissions in, in each cluster. Um, there are various different ways of looking at how clustery the clusters are, as in, if you have a good clustering, you might think you want them to be close together within a cluster and far apart between clusters. And that's what things like this done index measure. Um, a done index of 0.33 is not particularly high. But then again, we're talking about quite a complex phenomenon here. And maybe we wouldn't expect um, our clusters to be completely distinct when we're looking at something as complex as, um, as multimorbidity. However, there's probably room for improvement here. Um, this is a, a first um, way of visualizing the clusters, which looks at the frequency of occurrence of each diagnostic code within each cluster. Um, so um, the percentage of admissions with that code. So, for example, if we look at um, the first four clusters, one, two, three and four, all have pneumonia as um, the, the, the most commonly occurring code, probably indicating um, a more severe COVID admission. Um, as compared with, say, cluster six, which had cough and fever as the two most commonly occurring 
codes. Um, if we look at cluster one, for example, we can see that um, hypertension, diabetes are coming up fairly highly in, the, um, in this, this cluster, compared with cluster four, where there is not much in the way of um, additional comorbidities. So we can start to get a feel here for what other conditions patients had when they were in hospital or um, a priori coming into hospital um, with COVID. Um, the sex distribution across the clusters doesn't vary that much. Um, more men than women, which might not be surprising given what we know about COVID. Uh, the age distribution, um, particularly notable here, cluster four and cluster six contain younger people uh, on average than the other clusters. And then if we look at what happened to people when they were in hospital, um, the length of stay uh, distributions are shown on the left here on a log scale. You can see, for example, that cluster six has a lower length of stay on average than cluster one and cluster three. Um, and the in-hospital mortality for these patients. Um, again, noting a difference between cluster one with the comorbid COVID versus cluster four with perhaps more simple COVID. Um, we can put these two clusters next to each other to compare more easily. And so you can see here that um, cluster four is showing a, a younger group with fewer comorbidities dying in hospital less um, and staying in hospital for uh, a shorter period of time compared with cluster one. Uh, this is just one way of visualizing the results of these clusters. It's quite important to remember that um, this is very high dimensional uh, data. We've got lots and lots of uh, different codes flying around here. And um, this is just one simple way to look at the, the number of different codes present. So um, to summarize, we think that the use of these diagnostic ontologies um, has potential as a means of identifying clusters of multimorbidity in a population level in routinely collected healthcare data. The methods have been applied before on quite specific populations. So for example, um, uh, with kidney uh, disease in hospital, for example. Um, strengths are that they allow the clusters to arise empirically from the data. Um, we don't start here from a list of pre-existing conditions. Um, we, we allow the clustering to arise from the data itself. Um, if you're looking for new clusters, novel clusters of disease, that could be quite an advantage because if you're just looking between known um, collections of conditions, you may miss things that are, are more novel, more interesting. Um, there's quite a lot of flexibility in this method. You can configure the different ways of measuring that similarity between patients quite um, extensively. Um, we think that the COVID example gives some face validity to this. However, there are these uh, challenging computational aspects to the work, and we're working now on, um, well, sorry, the pilot study analysis took two weeks to run on our, um, on our um, trusted research environment. And so we're looking at now ways to speed that up significantly so that we can scale up to bigger samples and, and to subpopulation and population level. Um, we also want to take this to the primary care codes and use it on the SNOMED um, codes. This is a team uh, project across the two themes. Uh, some of the people involved are listed here. Uh, thank you very much for listening and we're happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, both of you. Um, there are some few minutes for some questions if anybody has them. Um, one from Miles in the chat, uh, hopefully you can see it says, how do you plan to reverse engineer this to allocate patients to a specific cluster, e.g. if a patient has a HT uh, and a couple of other conditions, which cluster are they in? Right, so um, this is actually not too difficult to do because what you can do is um, define, um, in some sense, the centre of each cluster. You can, uh, it's actually something called a centroid. Um, and then you can um, measure the distance between each of the cluster centers and the new person who you're wishing to sort of um, understand where they where they fit and so a simple way to do that with them would be the the cluster to which they are nearest if you see what i mean um, then there are other ways you can do where you might kind of fuzzy allocate people between different clusters but at a simple level it would just be um, uh, how close are they to the center of the cluster does that make sense that's one that's one way i think uh, I, I have a quick question as well. In your um, kind of figures, there are six clusters, which um, and then there were four kind of 
conditions in each cluster was that kind of pre-specified or was, are they the most frequent conditions that occur in that cluster yeah so these are the most frequently occurring conditions we've chopped it off at, at four just to so you can see what's on here um just to note also we we shaded any condition which occurred in less than 50 percent of the admissions within that cluster in a lighter color so the, the dark bars here are the other the conditions occurring in in more than half of the patients in that cluster um, and just to note therefore that of course not all of these clusters will be multi-morbid clusters if you see what I mean so um, you can look after the event and look to see well which clusters do actually have multiple long-term conditions within them um, or you can you could apply one of the existing um, lists of of, uh, uh, of of diagnosis type definitions a priori to to filter out codes that you're not interested in and then apply this method um, if you see what I mean so there's various different ways you could nuance this to get at different aspects of um, of multimorbidity um, and and one, a question in the chat as well um, so can one person be in only one cluster or can they be in multiple clusters or can they have different clusters of disease so when you train the, the clustering as it were when you run the clustering algorithm on the data itself uh, it will allocate each person to one cluster um i was when i mentioned the sort of fuzzy allocation there i was thinking more about um ways in which you might treat new individuals who were not part of the original data if you sort of mean and there you've got a choice you could either allocate them to one cluster or you could say well actually they're kind of halfway between these two or something do you see what i mean yeah uh, great um fantastic so if, yeah if anybody has any other questions please pop them in the chat and then hopefully uh, tom or darren will be able to answer them very happy to um, do so yeah thank you great thanks very much both of you um Moving on then to our final speaker from the ARCs. Um, the next speaker is Professor David Osborne, um, who's from ARC North Thames and York and Humber, um, and from the University of College London. Um, and they are going to be talking about addressing the mortality gap for people with severe mental illnesses. Uh, David, over to you. Great, thanks, Tom. Am I managing to share my screen and work on audio okay? Yep. Fine. Perfect. Hello, everybody, and thanks um, for the opportunity to talk to you today. And uh, like everybody else, I'm going to talk a little bit about this mortality gap in people with severe mental illness. And all of the work that we've done has been huge collaboration with, you know, uh, teams of GPs, clinicians, most importantly, the people with severe mental illness and various methodologists. But this, uh, this is a cross art project I'm going to talk to you about now the kind of primrose journey that we've had and it's with our friends up in uh, York and Humber who've also done a lot of work over the years in looking at um, long term conditions in people with severe mental illness so. It's something I got into very early when I became a psychiatrist, actually. I was a bit shocked that when you went into psychiatry, suddenly all the people talked about was mental health and started forgetting the training you'd had as a junior doctor in physical health and so-called hanging up your stethoscope kind of idea. But uh, in fact, we, we had look, looked at this problem probably 10, 15 years ago and used some of our wonderful UK uh, primary care data research um, resource. Um, and you see that people with severe mental illness are probably three times as likely to die from cardiovascular disease when they're under 50 and uh, unfortunately die 10 to 20 years younger than the general population. Um, just in case, because I know not everyone's familiar with this term, normally with severe mental illness, we're talking about people with conditions like bipolar disorder or um, psychoses. So that's the group that we're talking about. And we know the reasons behind much of this uh, premature mortality. It's often the highly modifiable risk factors like smoking, like obesity, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol. But then when you talk to folk with um, severe mental illness, they also describe their kind of experience of the, um, of the healthcare system. And they often talk about how their mental health um, overshadows their physical health. And so when they go along for an appointment, um, uh, they find that people are only focused on whether they're depressed, whether they're hearing voices, et cetera. And then the real reason they went along to their appointment gets um, ignored. And I mean, the good news is probably that for the last 10 to 15 years, people have actually started to prioritize this a lot. And we've had annual health checks, I'm afraid, for quite a long time. 
in, uh, in primary care. And, and we know that increasing annual health checks is still part of the um, long-term plan to address this problem. But many people have argued, you know, just having a check isn't quite enough. And what you really need is interventions that are going to really try and work with people to decrease the health um, concerns that they have. So that was partly what our Primrose program grant was about. Um, you know, frankly, it started, it was an NIHR program grant that started about uh, 10 years ago, um, bringing together all the best evidence with input from people with severe mental illness to really try and systematically address some of their um, long-term conditions and risk factors. So after a lot of development work, we came up with a rather flexible model whereby people co-produced um, sort of care plans together with practice nurses or healthcare um, assistants. And they were offered about eight to 12 appointments over six months. So some of our behaviour change um, specialists helped us to really look at some simplified behavioural support to try and help people to achieve the goals that they wanted to achieve around their health. And there was plenty of follow up and monitoring within that model. It was published a couple of years ago. It was a cluster randomised trial that was published in Lancet Psychiatry. Um, and I'm just going to tell you the very headline findings from that program grant. Uh, so there were 67 practices across England, and it really was well spread across the north, the south, um, and the east of England. But as with everything, we've talked about the difficulty in, in multiple long-term conditions about thinking about what should be your outcome measure. And rightly or wrongly in this study, because it was particularly focused on um, things like obesity and particularly around managing cholesterol. Our primary outcome was cholesterol, which went down in both groups, but not significantly. So did we achieve anything in the trial? Well, it was fascinating that with all the economic um, analysis there, it turned out that people who received this intervention had fewer admissions, particularly um, psychiatric hospitalizations and, and therefore lower costs. I thought the beauty of having a program grant was that you could do far more kind of parallel studies with the trial and we found we were able to look at whether people delivered the intervention which they did it had great fidelity they did do the behavior change techniques people with SMI liked it they came along a lot with a mean of attending six sessions and there was really good goal setting but what we did see was that actually the goals that tended to be set weren't around things like statins which would probably of course affect your cholesterol as well as being effective in people with SMI. So we got to a point where we've got a good intervention that's deliverable that decreases cost but needs adaptation if it's going to have an impact on cardiovascular risk. So I'm going to just talk to you about this is one of the projects as you heard earlier that's part of the uh, Managing Long-Term Conditions Implementation Programme. Um, and I can't take credit for this because what happened after Primrose was some colleagues here in North London, clinical colleagues and commissioners, took it upon themselves to adapt Primrose. And uh, they wanted to involve peer coaches more in it, but also to look around medication adherence within the Primrose model that we developed. Um, and they did it. They did it through the pandemic, in fact. So managed to still adapt it to be uh, remotely delivered and they had pretty good recruitment and um, a lot of excellent both quantitative and qualitative feedback. So the clinicians, um, which was GPs and people in the Mental Health Trust, uh, got together with our AHSN at um, UCL Partners and, and a chap called Matt Kearney, who many of you probably know, who was the National Clinical Director for Cardiovascular Disease, and tried to pull in some of the more recent kind of frameworks for managing um, cardiovascular risk factors but amalgamate them with Primrose A with some of the things that worked in the Primrose A model, both for the people with SMI and for the people who were delivering it. So we've, our plan is we're now integrating um, Primrose with these proactive care frameworks, which are being rolled out um, nationally in the NHS to manage cardiovascular disease in the general population. And we're then looking to implement this across our patch and also up in York and Humber. So we've got um, great colleagues from the Bradford Improvement Academy working with us and also from our UCL partners, AHSN. So 
that's where we're up to. So I brought a slide just with some of the implementation methods um, that we're going to be used, but obviously it's a mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative process. And really seeing, A, how well can you combine these frameworks with Primrose, but also what are the barriers and facilitators to actually getting this rolled out through um, different patches in the NHS? So where are we up to? We've got our new model, which has been developed in workshops with um, PPI input, as well as uh, various input from the uh, multiple disciplinary teams. So we've got our new training package. Um, and I'm pleased to say this area really is a big interest now, both on the ground and with commissioners. So we've had further interest from Northeast England and people out to the east of our patch. Um, Meanwhile, and again, I take no credit for this, but some of the team who were working on the ground delivering Primrose, they were, I think they were highly commended in the BMJ awards just this month. Um, and then perhaps talking a bit about the learning from PPI. The original program grant had lots of PPI throughout it, but again, we want to build on that. And we've got new plans with our peer coaches here in North London who've been working on Primrose, but also the excellent PPI up in York and Humber Arc, particularly um, something called Diamond's Voice, who are a specific group looking at diabetes and severe mental illness. So we're hoping to get going um, this month. And I think, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you for listening and thanks specifically to the teams. Great. Thanks very much, David. Um, hopefully some people have some questions for you. Um, we've got a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, I've got some questions as well. Um, a lot of what you talked about in, in terms of things like reducing cholesterol and improving like statin adherence is quite can be quite generalizable to other conditions apart from those living with severe mental illness I, I was wondering what was it about primrose that was kind of specific to that group was it what what was kind of needed to be was there a way it was delivered a way it was adapted um what made it specific to, to that group of people Sure, sure. One of the things was particularly training up, so it was delivered in primary care, so particularly training up some of the um, primary care nurses and healthcare assistants and giving them more confidence in working with people with severe mental illness because they had some of their own fears about what this actually meant, who the people were. It was a very flexible approach to appointments, so people with SMI had often said that the appointments were too short, that they would occur kind of early in the morning, which was challenging for them. So there was a much more um, adaptable way to deliver those as well as some reminders along the way to help people to engage. So that was what was particularly different. I think you might argue that was transferable to, to other people in the population, but they were some of the specific things. And and you mentioned about reducing um, costs and admissions. What and but there wasn't much of a change in particularly your primary outcome. What do you think was driving, primarily driving that reduction in, in admissions and costs? Well, it's interesting. I suppose if you what you could argue is actually what people were receiving was a particularly structured intervention and support there. There were some other elements I haven't talked about about involving people's carers or what were called supportive others in the intervention as well so perhaps there was something about continuity that uh, doesn't occur in other settings actually that was central to the primrose intervention mm -hmm. and uh, and one more question for myself um you said there was a bit about goal setting and um uh, one of the things that wasn't pertain they weren't kind of maybe setting goals that you perhaps thought in terms of like adherence to statins what kind of things were they were the goal setting around what things were they choosing uh, from memory i think there were some goals uh, what we tried to do is to uh, get people to think well, what are the main um, health risk factors for you but i think a lot of people tended to focus on things like um, diet and exercise rather than perhaps also the adherence so when we all audio taped the um, the interviews um, it was clear that the conversations hadn't happened about their medication even if that wasn't going to be the goal that they set so i suppose that comes back to what you said before about them having kind of 
a structured you know intervention and it wasn't necessarily what exactly what maybe you had planned but it, yeah and, and, and perhaps it's controversial and it comes back to having you know conversations in an open way and, and having co-produced care plans but i suppose what we never wanted to do was it just be a medication trial for people but then perhaps there is something also about making sure people have information on what are the most effective interventions for their particular condition and perhaps that nuance was lost a bit in um, primrose yeah great um if there's no more questions i mean if there are some questions please put them in the chat and um, i'm sure david will will answer them um but thank you very much uh, david really great presentation uh so that's um all the speakers from the different arcs that we've uh, that we're going to hear from um and just for the final 15 minutes we've got two more speakers uh, the first of which is Professor Gary, Bo uh, Gary Ford, sorry, um, who's going to be talking about multiple long-term conditions and um, particularly approaches to implementation. So thank you very much, Gary, for, for joining. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Tom. I hope no one's too bored by uh, my talk. Uh, tell me if that is visible. Um, yeah. um, I've, sorry, I've got on the wrong slide. So. Um, great, I'll move that over. Great, so um, I was asked to talk about, um, so I'll try and move this out of the way, multiple long-term conditions and approaches to implementation. So I'm gonna give a perspective from um, the Academic Health Science Networks from an implementation point of view um, and draw a little bit on um, some of the work I've been involved with in stroke. So I just want to pick up the first comment that um, um, Chris Whitty made around you know, what the aim is. It's, it's compressing the um, period of disability, disability life years. Um, this is not a, a new concept. It was actually articulated most clearly back in you know, 40 years ago by Jim Fries and this article in the England Journal of Medicine. And um, uh, a few points to make about this the probably mostly what the health uh, care systems have been doing around the world in recent years certainly in developed countries is uh, increasing um, life expectancy but at the extent of uh, increasing the number of uh, years that people spend uh, disabled um, another general point is disability is not always the most helpful term when we're we're talking about um, uh, interventions in uh, this group and I'll, I'll give uh, of people and I'll give an example later on from the stroke field and fundamentally it comes down to quality of life which of course is uh, hard to show is shifted by many of our interventions but but I think it's probably a particularly important element um, in people with multiple long-term conditions to be thinking about and, and also the general thing is that health related quality of life or is it overall quality of life so I just want to go back to um, the um, survey uh, we did some years ago, which the Edge Sands led with involvement of the ARCs. Um, uh, Louise Wood and I uh, were asked if this is one of a set of actions um, in some work between NHS England and NIHR, and just look through the main themes that emerged there. And integrating care for older people with frailty slash complex needs, multiple morbidity, was one of the key four areas that came out. And many of these have been discussed, um, the bullet points around polypharmacy, uh, the importance of looking at both mental and physical health, uh, taking a holistic view of the patient, looking at new models of care and uh, uh, technology to support people, and um, you know, thinking about um, the uh, you know, alternative models of care. I think what is interesting actually as a, as a side point is that um, all these priorities, if anything, have, have been shown to be even more important in the context of um, the pandemic and how the health service needs to respond to the issues and challenges raised by that. Um, sorry, I'm... Yeah. Um, the other thing in terms of thinking around implementation in people with 
multiple long-term conditions is to just look at the conditions that are there. So uh, this doesn't cover everybody, of course, but this is a, um, uh, a description of the commonest conditions in the Newcastle 85 plus study population, um, which um, found that um, in this group, um, only um, less than 1% had no, none of the top 20 conditions and 6% um, uh, had, uh, had, had only one condition. So the vast majority of people had two or more conditions with slightly more commonly being seen uh, in, uh, in women. So I think the two obvious points that seem to me to arise from this, that if you're designing interventions for um, people with multiple long-term conditions, you need to ensure in your design that you deal with issues of uh, hearing impairment, visual impairment, and cognitive impairment. And secondly, for drug therapies, you think about uh, you know, ensuring there's appropriate dose adjustment for renal impairment. And I think these are, um, uh, and just because of the prevalence of these problems, that should be routine, it strikes me, and is a relatively um, straightforward issue to think about in design. The second is that if you're thinking about a shared decision making framework, I haven't got time to sort of discuss what they might look like, and um, uh, that's this whole separate topic. It, it needs to be done in the context of the frequent coexistence of um, the, those five conditions listed there, cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, urine incontinence, COPD and falls. So I think there's a, something around just, these are not necessarily the targets of the intervention, but they need to be taken account of when you're thinking at least certainly in older people about the, um, a, a service pathway or intervention. The other thing is, and I think this has been covered earlier, you, it, if you have multiple long-term conditions, you, essentially this drives polypharmacy and strongly associated with it. And the key um, person at the center of that is the general practitioner. They may not initiate all the therapies, but they certainly continue all the therapies. So um, we need to think about um, this element um, in, um, improving the care of um, people with multiple long-term conditions and the, the pivotal role of the general practitioner or those who uh, he or she delegates responsibility for prescribing to. So what about the evidence for interventions uh, that can improve outcomes in people with polypharmacy? And this is an area that we are currently exploring as a network as a potential future national program but this is a relatively recent, uh, well, very recent um, systematic review, um, 2021 in BMC Geriatrics, which looked at 32 studies and um, uh, some of them with a reasonable methodological design, um, at three areas, medication appropriateness, inappropriately prescribed medication, in, and in older people with multiple conditions, you're, you're often targeting um, opioid drugs, uh, sedatives and hypnotics, and anticholinergics, and reduction of prescribing emissions by promoting uh, prescribing evidence-based therapy. And the conclusion was that it's unclear where these interventions, you know, sort of standard thing that goes on all the time, a lot of resource goes in to um, employing pharmacists to do this, reviewing patient prescriptions, resulting in clinical significant improvement. However, there's a suggestion it, it may have some benefit in terms of reducing prescribing emissions, but that was only on two studies. I think the other area um, uh, we've been explored is um, de-prescribing. And um, if you look at de-prescribing, it's even a smaller uh, data, um, database. And this was in, um, sorry, this was the BMC Geriatrics on 2021. The, um, the, top, the top one was uh, Cochrane Systematic Review in 2018. And if you look at that, um, there's really very little evidence, uh, and yet despite a lot of discussion and talk about de-prescribing in people with polypharmacy. So we do need more uh, research and work in this area. 
again, it does seem that uh, recent studies have shown these. Um, it is possible with um, you know up to ninety percent of recommendations being implemented. Um, the review of um, the um, uh, Cochrane review didn't include. I'm not quite sure or sure why the pincer intervention, which was developed in the uh, Midlands area with the East Midlands area with the Department of Health Patient Safety Research Portfolio Grant, and was published back in 2012. And this was um, a good RCT. It's a um, uh, tool for analysing. Um, uh, the prescribing an individual patients accompanied by a pharmacist intervention and um, showed that it significantly improved a number of um, areas of, of problematic prescribing like non-selective NSAIDs in people with a history of peptic ulcer without taking a PPI or H2 antagonist, beta blocker in people with asthma and you know, people on ACE inhibitors or the directions that monitoring. And that seemed to be highly cost effective. And that was a program that the HSNs picked up nationally and was successful in implementing in um, sort of implementation across over a third of GP practice in England. So I think that there are nuggets one can take of um, interventions which can be helpful uh, in, in this population. Um, the other thing is just thinking, um, taking the principles of um, uh, what drives uptake of innovations and thinking about that in the context of people with multiple long term conditions. So these are the um, you're, many of you will be familiar with this the principles articulated by Rogers some 20 years ago. Um, the concept of relative advantage, compatibility with existing values and practices, simplicity and ease of use. Uh, the extent to which people can try out, that's what trialability needs, not RCT, and innovation. And can you see the results of, of what you do? So um, you know, if you take my own area of work, acute stroke, um, you can see the result with thrombectomy. You, know, the, 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 um, you can see the thrombus come out and you can see the patient improve and you can see a better CT scan the, ne ne the next day. And these factors are said to determine uh, between 50 and 80 percent of the variation adoption you see of new products in any area, not just healthcare. So, what about this? So, these are just my sort of reflections on on this framework, and we're thinking about people with you know, multiple long-term conditions. So, the concept of relative advantage: Do we understand what healthcare professionals consider? We can say patients' considerations are important, but uh, what we need to understand what healthcare professionals, the NHS, considers important. Is it reduced healthcare utilization? Is it improved quality of life? Is it increased survival? Not it's more it's not so straightforward as with some of our you know, key single disease areas where we have key concepts like measures of disability and stroke, for example. Um, compatibility with existing values and practices. Um, and uh, Chris Whitty commented on this earlier. We have a problem that the culture of medicine is focused on the diagnosis and treatment of single conditions. And um, I put in a quote, um, which a friend and colleague of mine who's a professor of geriatric clinical pharmacology made in Australia, that he was commenting on the Optimize a study that um, my colleague Richard McMallis led, uh, looking at um, de-prescribing of blood pressure drugs and people have well-controlled blood pressure in older people. And uh, I collaborated on that study. We were just discussing it. And he says, it just shows it's impossible to get doctors to change their prescribing habits because it's it attacks the values of the Church of Medicine and our status as high priest doctors. And don't underestimate that culture and how difficult it is to change. The next is we're dealing with um, patients who are complex um, because they have multiple problems and, and our interventions do need to be simple. And that's not an easy challenge to meet. And how can we design things that can be tried out without having to do major training or capital investment? And the final comment I'll make is, I think in this group of people, it's, it's probably not so straightforward to see observable results so easily. And that means we have to think about what we put into service evaluation and audit, and also what, what, what are the outcomes in research evaluations. So um, just taking an example of what it might look like, and I think this is a, it wasn't designed as a study to look at people with multiple 
long-term conditions, but it was in stroke survivors. And these are, for the large part, older people. People who go to supported discharge teams have uh, neurological impairment and functional problems at discharge. And they nearly all have other um, con long-term conditions. So the intervention here was additional reviews beyond the typical time that people would receive support. So it's continuing reviews after people are basically stabilized in terms of their functional recovery from an, a, a community-based rehab team. And they were mostly telephones um, and uh, reviews asking patients how they're getting along um, in terms of their function. I think uh, if you look at what was actually done, it, it probably more social in interventions than pure rehab interventions but this was a, a study designed by rehabilitation researchers so the outcome was an awesome extended adl scale which showed no difference but if you look at the standard disability measure on the, the modified ranking score it was borderline significance and an eight percent difference in the modified ranking scale would certainly be considered very clinically significant and is what you're seeing with thrombolysis for example in the three to four and a half hour time window in terms of the absolute treatment benefit and there were few cases of anxiety and depression and uh, there were it's improved quality of life and healthcare resource utilization health and social care resource utilization was less and when the cost effectiveness analysis was done it was in the bottom right corner so this is um from an HSM perspective, this is gold dust. There are so few things we see which um, improve quality of life and come with um, uh, less cost to the health and social care system. And I think this is sort of maybe indicating that a sort of holistic, not sort of a planned holistic, not just to team input into people, uh, perhaps rather than them being abandoned, which is the common, um, sort of reporting back from stroke uh, survivors can make um, you know, a significant difference, but not necessarily on the uh, um, standard disability measures you might choose to look at. And this trial, because it was overall neutral and primary outcome, you know, a lot of people, methodologists will say, um, well, you can't really pay much heed on these secondary outcome measures, they are hypothesis generating. But in terms of what impact it, data does the health service need to put something in place with something which has high face validity of being something we should be doing anyway. Um, I think my own view is this sort of data, personally, I think is enough. Um, so this is my final slide. So, so I think a key focus has to be in primary care. I mean, that was an example that was in the community in primary care, but from a pathway that entered from secondary care. And the classic Willie Sutton comment, why, why do it in primary care? Because that's where the problem is. That's where most of the management of people with multiple long conditions lies. Um, we need further research to evaluate interventions uh, that have a meaningful impact that are targeted at polypharmacy. I think there's a weak evidence base at the moment. And until, and, and, and if we get the magic bullet of a drug that targets the aging process and um, the prevents or delays the onset of uh, multiple long term conditions. We need to think about how we effectively deploy single target therapies and service innovations to the benefit of people with multiple long term conditions, who is often uh, most of the people these are being actually who are receiving these single therapy services. And I think the priority is the development of integrated care pathways that promote a holistic view of the patient. And include shared decision making and, and i would just comment that is not the sole domain and ownership of primary care there are many people are interested in this in secondary care as well and i'll stop there thank you very much thanks very much uh, gary um for the interest of time um if anybody has any questions please put them in the chat and I'm sure Gary will uh, respond. Um, our final speaker of the afternoon then is Dr. Fionn Curtis from Arc East Midlands and she's going to be talking about future challenges to multimorbidity research in the uh, post-COVID era. Um, Fionn, over to you. Great, thanks Tom. And uh, in the thinking about time, I'll just jump straight into it. So, 
Briefly to set the scene, the Academy of Medical Sciences published an international policy report evaluating the grown issue of multimorbidity as a globe health, global health challenge. That was in 2018. The number of people living with multiple health conditions continues to increase and meeting their needs is one of the biggest challenges facing the NHS. At that time, it was reported that one in four adults had two or more health conditions and the number of people with four or more conditions would double by 2035. Um, then the pandemic, which has placed additional risks on those with multimorbidity. A global survey evaluating the impact of COVID-19 on routine care for chronic disease found that most healthcare professionals identified moderate or severe effects on their patients due to changes in healthcare services, with 80% reporting worse mental health. Healthcare and risk factor control was significantly compromised during the height of the virus and various lockdowns, the effects of which will be felt for some time. And we will likely see an increase in multimorbidity beyond those pre-pandemic estimations. So moving forward and research in the post-pandemic era, fingers crossed. The impact of the condition is influenced not only by health-related characteristics, but also by socioeconomic, cultural and environmental factors and patient behaviour, all of which have changed in the face of the pandemic. In this post-COVID era, multimorbidity continues to be a significant healthcare challenge and is a major strategic priority for the NIHR, who have set out these core aims to support the development of an evidence base to address multimorbidity. Firstly, we need to listen and identify the problems and outcomes that matter most to people with multiple conditions and their carers, and understand how they would like to see services configured to meet their needs. People with multiple conditions say they want greater service integration, more person-centered holistic care, and better support for well-being. Another important area is to continue developing our understanding of clusters as a potential route for improving the management of multiple conditions and setting priorities in public health and healthcare. Key questions include, what are the determinants of the most common clusters? How do different clusters affect the severity of COVID? How will this look in the context of long COVID? Clusters could offer insight into underlying causal mechanisms and disease pathways. Better understanding could, for example, inform risk management strategies and the development of new drugs. However, the heterogeneous nature of the underlying disease clusters and the complex interactions between different risk factors continue to make this a challenging and a generalist multidisciplinary team approach may be more important than pathways and guidelines based on specific diseases and disease clusters. Evidence on the best approaches to prevent multiple conditions is generally lacking, again in part because of our single disease focus historically. Improving the quality of life for people with multiple conditions could also be difficult because solutions require actions beyond the remit of just healthcare. The importance of deprivation and other common public health risk factors means that effective pre prevention is likely to require population-based strategies that tackle the environmental, social and economic determinants of health. So can healthcare systems be better organised to maximise the benefits and limit the risks for patients with multimorbidity? At a guess, I would say yes. Healthcare systems tend to focus on individual diseases or issues. They have frequently um, failed to respond to the needs of the whole person. And this situation is reinforced by medical training models, treatment guidelines, and drug efficacy trials, all of which are typically premised on people with single conditions. Often trials have excluded those with comorbidity, which clearly leaves unanswered questions with regards to how the drug or intervention would affect a person with multimorbidity. We need to continue moving forward from this and deliver research that enables health and social care systems to take a more patient-centered whole person approach to the treatment and care for people with multiple conditions. Future health care needs to redesign to look after people with multimorbidity rather than single disease models of care. 
COVID has demonstrated how swiftly we're able to react and respond to a significant health crisis. Let's hope we can respond as well to the ongoing challenge of multimorbidity. Whilst there are clearly many unanswered questions in this area, the quality of um, some of the research presented here today should leave us in no doubt that collectively we are well positioned to work collaboratively and address many of the challenges presented to us by multimorbidity in this post-COVID era. Okay, Tom. I see you've uh, switched your camera on. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Fion. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, like I said before, if anybody has any questions, and I'm sure Fion will be happy to answer them in in the chat. Um, yeah. I'm actually go on. No, no, carry on. I was just going to say that I'm actually going to um, do the final comments and close the presentation. But I'm just, do you have anything to say first, Tom? I do not. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Kamala just asked me just to do final comments and to obviously thank everybody for pulling this together today. So that would be the people who organise this and obviously you, Tom, you've done a great job today, Chair, and this afternoon. But thank you, Carol, Michelle, Orange Juice Communications, what a great name, Ollie and Donna. And of course, um, what a great day it's been because having Chris Whitty as our um, keynote speaker, I think that's a real accolade to how the quality of our work is being perceived. And for that, Kamlesh, I think we'd really like to thank you and your great leadership because uh, without you, we wouldn't all be here today. I think everyone would agree with me, it's been a really good event. And hopefully, I can see lots of networking going on in the chat. And I hope everyone continues this afterwards because I'm sure that everybody here today would really like to continue these discussions moving forward and collaborate in the future. So yeah, thank you everybody. It's been a great good day. Thank you everyone for joining. Yeah. <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs>